with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. My name is Emma Bigland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Sarah Mathisen, Mathisen, Assistant Professor of History and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at George Washington University and author of Reproduction, Reconceived, Family Making, and the Limits of Choice after Roe v. Wade. Meanwhile, Putin said yesterday that his main goal of the war was to, quote, help people in Ukraine's east. Helping Ukrainians by killing Ukrainians. Got it? But his emphasis on the East confirms that Russian forces are set to focus their energy in the Donbass. And in the face of this, the Pentagon is set to dramatically increase the scope of weapons it is giving to Ukraine. So that's going to end great. Here in New York City, as of now, it appears the prime suspect in the terrifying subway shooting is still at large. Subject to change, obviously. This is, you know, we're noon on Wednesday. The suspect regularly posted anti-Semitic, anti-Black, and generally hateful and violent rhetoric on his social media pages. The world has surpassed 500 billion known COVID cases after hitting the 300 million mark in January and 400 million, or billion, wait, wait. I'm getting this wrong. There's no way. Did I say 500 billion? 500 million. That's what I meant. Right, Bradley? Half a billion. Sheesh. More than 5.1 billion people have received at least one vaccine dose, but African nations lag behind because of lack of access. Numbers aren't my strong suit, guys. In the UK, Boris Johnson was fined by police for breaking lockdown rules and attending a party. So there's that. Back in the US, the Biden administration is suspending a rule that blocks summertime sales of higher ethanol gasoline blends, which experts say probably won't even do anything to affect gas prices, but it's just the perception of doing something while also contributing to climate change. They're not serious about addressing climate change, folks. And lastly, Oklahoma's Republican governor has officially signed into law the state's complete and total abortion ban, a ban that begins at conception, no exception for rape or for incest. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Sam is still out. If you're just tuning in for the first time, uh, our our friend and boss, Sam. Our captain has fallen ill. <laughs> yes, uh, has COVID. We are wishing him well. We are in contact with him. He's confined to the captain's quarters. Yes. Um, I mean, that's a, that's the story we're going with, as opposed to the fact that we were slowly poisoning him through Sebe Day. Well, actually, we were at Boris Johnson's parties. Uh, that's how we captured the bioweapon. Yes, at Damning Street. Oh, good sir. Um... We're, uh, you know, also just a, a, for everybody here in New York City, uh, if you're listening, I hope you're okay. Thankfully, we're okay after this very scary uh, subway attack yesterday that the details of, I mean, it's it's straight up it's comic movie uh, Gotham stuff. If w- real people weren't hurt, it, it sounds like it's a, it, would, it was a stage scene in a movie, but it was just actually real. Really, really terrifying stuff. Um, for those of you who may not know, yesterday, a uh, shooter 
in a subway car earlier in the morning when people were commuting for work, set off some sort of smoke bomb, and open fired in a crowded subway car. Thankfully, as of now, while there are injuries, there have not been any deaths reported. There are, are, are victims who are in critical condition, but seem to be stable according to current reports and the suspect uh is still at large as of the time uh, of our recording of this so there's a lot of anxiety surrounding that and and based on his social media posts um if he ended up being the one who did this hateful rhetoric towards a lot of ethnic groups uh and hateful rhetoric towards uh sex workers towards um houseless people but that ha doesn't stop eric adams from going on morning joe uh this morning and still blaming homeless people anyway we must have a safe reliable and dependable dependable subway system and you know there's many naysayers um, as we attempt to uh, clean up the encampments, uh, get those who are homeless into a uh, Clean up the encampments? Are they sending maids there to help them sort of tidy up around there? Or are they bulldozing them and removing them entirely? Like, this sort of euphemism really gives the game away. We're cleaning it up. Mm -hmm. Those who are homeless into uh, wraparound services and zero in on crime. Uh, they're, they're a small numerical minority who are the loudest, uh, who want to push back on our attempts uh, to make sure our city is a safe, clean city. And we're not going to succumb uh, to their theory and we're not going to succumb to their loud noise. This city is going to be a safe city and our subway system is going to be a safe subway system. Uh, but, you know, you have my commitment on that. And we so the naysayers that he described who are critiquing his handling of homelessness in the city are uh, advocates and experts in this area. I want to turn to this piece that Alex Press wrote in Jacobin. It was very timely, and we're having uh, Alex on the show tomorrow. Perhaps we can talk about this then. Uh, then. But this was just, you know, uh, go, go check out uh, her piece in Jacobin. It's called On Homelessness, Eric Adams Has Made Sadism New York's Official Policy. She writes, Encampment suites are not new. Similar efforts provoked a ride in Tompkins Square Park in 1988 and proceeded apace under Rudy Giuliani in the, in the 1990s. Under Bill de Blasio, nearly 10,000 sweeps were conducted by the Department of Sanitation uh, of Homeless Services and the NYPD between 2016 and 2021, with sweeps even ramping up during the pandemic. De Blasio himself personally called in some of those sweeps, according to recently unearthed emails. But Eric Adams has made the policy an especially public priority. The mayor's embrace of his role as the city's top hype man and his background as a police officer all but guaranteed such a response to arguments put forth by business groups, such as the Partnership for New York City. The organization has said that, quote, the number one reason people are resistant to coming back to in-person work is fear of the subways, of conditions on the streets, of open abuse of drugs, of homeless, mentally ill people. Um, so this is just a reminder that these same groups, restaurant groups that were pushing people to get back to work before it was safe to do so during the pandemic, business groups, things of that nature, collections of bosses that wield their power and influence politicians, although Adams' spokesperson told Gothamist, no, we're not influenced by this. Um, these are the same people that are claiming that uh, homelessness is the number one reason that uh, city restaurant patronship Patron, uh, patronage <laughs> is not up to the degree that it was before the pandemic, Ludicrous. right? The pandemic, that might be the reason why things haven't picked up. You know, the fact that people are still uh, getting infected with COVID and are fearful of contracting a disease that for immunocompromised and older folks could be deadly for them. Um, the fact that we had a vaccine mandate, there is going to be a small portion of unvaccinated people that are not coming to the city. Fine. Uh, I'm fine with that as well. But like, yet they are using the most vulnerable people in our city as a scapegoat for the fact that their margins aren't as fat as they would like Which is right just, now. The homelessness is just a symptom of the same problem, obviously, right? right? Like rising homelessness because we're living in a pandemic and we're not assisting people the way we need to. And a reminder, uh, there's no evidence that the suspect thus far was homeless. 
So Eric Adams is using this opportunity on Morning Joe to like hide the ball. And despite the fact that he has emphasized we need more cops in the subways, we need more cops cracking down, down on kids jumping turnstiles. Um, despite the fact that there was an increase cop presence in our subways that didn't stop this guy so now we have to blame the homeless even though there seemingly has nothing to do i mean this, the, the sad the, thing, with the facts that we have right now the sad thing about the homeless angle is that i mean homeless people are getting murdered at a high rate there's one guy who got arrested for killing five uh, homeless people in the recent months and uh this was this gets the attention because it was non-homeless people yep. that were shot not even killed but like you, if he if he would have if if he would have even at one time killed like five homeless people it would have been a news story but you know there wouldn't be like amber alert style texts going out from the nypd saying hey that guy that got away because we didn't shut down the uh, subway sta- uh, trains leaving the station um help us find him uh yeah I, you know right and so um to that point, NYPD officials said they have thus far conducted more than 300 encampment suites, the majority of which have been in Manhattan, according to Adams. OK, so by the way, of course, when they're in Manhattan, his claims from via his spokesperson that this is not for like the business industry, for the uh, the partnership for New York City, these organizations that are trying to promote tourism and restaurant uh, patronage They, you know, that 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 you'd think that they would be in the other boroughs as well not just in like the the richest areas of the city. According to Adams, by the end of March, just five people living in those encampment, encampments accepted shelter services. These numbers show the reality of sweeps as theater. An estimated 2,400 New Yorkers live on the street without shelter. Around 4,800, or I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 4,800 live in shelters. And almost everyone who loses their encampment remains on the street. So the reality is, even if this suspect were homeless and again there's no evidence to that nature what would this crackdown have done it would have just shuffled him to the street he would have still been in the same position that he's in i mean the only solution to this is housing that is the only solution and of course increase you know health care and mental health services but throughout history the ones that alex lists here these you know the raids conducted by Giuliani, de Blasio, now Adams, of course, under Bloomberg, right? None of it has really changed much because housing is not guaranteed. And like the programs that they have here, here's another piece. This is from uh, the New York Daily News. New NYC bureaucracy keeps qualified homeless out of thousands of vacant apartments, thousands of apartments that homeless New Yorkers qualified for through uh, city housing vouchers remained unavailable to them last year thanks to a tangle of red tape that advocates say is keeping homeless and shelters far longer than needed. The vouchers, known as the uh, Family Homelessness and Eviction Protection Supplements, became more valuable last year after the city passed a law increasing their worth. Governor Hochul also signed a separate provision allowing the state to cover 100% of a market rate rent through its vouchers, up from previously 85%. The increased value has made it easier for people living in shelters to financially qualify for renting apartments. That's the key phrase there. Financially qualify. Not guaranteeing housing. You have to financially qualify to get accepted to this program. And even if you are accepted, as this piece is saying, there's a tangle of red tape where you might not even be able to to actually utilize this program. It, sh- it shows that uh, those who qualify for city vouchers, a relatively small percentage were actually able to move out of shelters and into a new home. So it's only uh, only 24 percent of households that were approved last December were able to secure an apartment. You know, just. Financially qualifying for housing is not enough. We have to guarantee it. We have to guarantee it. And if you're and actually, access to housing. Yeah. And if you're actually serious about this actually serious about helping solve homelessness in the city there is one solution that's the only solution but the only thing adams cares about here is the optics of it for the business interests that he serves the restaurant industry says we don't want homeless people outside of our west village nice restaurant please it's it's hurting uh our our margins that's what they're 
scapegoating but and so he's listening to them but he's also listening to the real estate developers that were on his election committee and that he cozies up to who do not want to get serious about affordable and guaranteed housing in this city which would actually help solve the problem yeah but uh, you got the high the real estate developers of luxury housing and the slum lords like the one that uh, was in that apartment fire that he is um but he's responsible for yeah study after study has shown that that is what reduces crime housing getting people off the streets so that they can actually deal with their health so that they aren't in such precarious situations so that they could potentially get get back on their feet and yet he's using this scary, terrifying instance as an opportunity to continue to kick the most vulnerable populations in the city that he refuses to help and that mayor be- uh, the mayors before him have uh, uh, done so as well, maybe a bit more quietly under de Blasio. Adams is making this a feature of his... Uh, uh, his office and and you know his front facing campaign uh to probably continue to be mayor for for the next term right he wants this to be at the forefront of his tough on crime approach and it's just theater as alex writes in jacobin so you know don't look don't look at the fact that increased policing didn't do anything to stop this scary incident don't look at the fact that our Cruel policies towards homeless people do nothing to solve the problem. We just care about the aesthetics for tourism and uh, people coming to our restaurants, and we don't give a damn about the actual people affected by this. With that said, we have a sponsor. Hard to transition to that, but this is one of our favorite sponsors, if not our favorite. It's nearly 420. When is, uh, that's got to be a week from today. Yeah. A week from today. And Sunset Lake Sebe Day, they're having a fundraiser, and it starts today. It started already at 8 a.m., and it ends next week, April 24th, right before midnight at 11.59 p.m. 40% off smokables like hemp flour, pre-rolls, and keef, and 30% off of everything else. No promo code is needed. Products are already going to be discounted on the website for Sunset Lake Seba Day. Um, so uh, there, there's going to be also um, a, a partnership with the Innocence Project here that um, I think Sam might have more of the details on this, uh, so I apologize. But uh, Sunset Lake Seba Day and Majority Report are teaming up to turn everyone's favorite stoner holiday into a fundraising opportunity. Here we go for the Innocence Project, a great organization working to undo the damage of the war on drugs. Here's how it works. Visit Sunset Lake Seba Day dot com starting Wednesday, April 13th. Sunset Lake Seba Day will be offering 40 percent off smokables like hemp flour, pre rolls and keef and every other product will be 30 percent off. Um, you know, I have been open about how I use the tincture pretty much every night to try to go to sleep. I have a bit of trouble, trouble with sleeping. My mind is very active at night and sunset like seven is one of the only things that actually helps me sleep. I don't want to go on prescriptions like Ambien and things like that. So uh, I'm very, very grateful for their product. It's high quality. I've tried crappy seven before. This is not that. Sunset Lake Sebede will donate 4.2% of its sales to the Innocent Project, really 4.20% of its sales, a nonprofit organization that works to free the innocent, prevent wrongful convictions, and create fair, compassionate, compassionate and equitable systems of justice for everyone. Sunset Lake Sebede is a majority employee-owned business that donated more than $26,000 last year to anti-drug war organizations, animal shelters, union strike funds, nature conservation, food shelves, and refugee resettlement organizations. They're the real deal, folks. They actually live, uh, preach, uh, practice what they preach, live by uh, their values. Again, visit sunsetlakesebeday.com to take advantage of these discounts and help Majority Report raise money for a great organization. The sale ends April 24th. So check it out. Go now, go today, but you have through April 24th to take advantage of this. And lastly, the latest IPCC report recently came out, and as we highlighted on the show, it's very scary, not good news. 
Solar alone won't solve climate change, but it is certainly part of the solution. And the tax credit extensions due to COVID are now done. So 2022 is the last year of the 26% credit before it drops down to 22%. So you need to take advantage of this now, folks. The solar consultant who is a fan and longtime listener of this program with years of working in the solar industry is, uh, my, is the solar nerd. If you're a homeowner, you may have considered solar but didn't know where to start. Do it through mysolarnerd.com. There's a lot of homeowners that aren't aware of the solar options currently available. It is now possible to retrofit your home with solar panels for no money down. My Solar Nerd's mission is simple. Help you find the best solar program for your home and make the transition as easy and smooth as possible. My Solar Nerd does this by analyzing your usage, finding the best equipment for your needs, determining the incentives and financing you may qualify for, project manage the process between you and the installers, obtaining permits, etc., all the stuff you may not know how to do. Do not wait. Some of these tax credits and incentives are sunsetting. As I mentioned, the current 26% tax credit drops down to 22% next year before going away. If a project is completed by the end of the year, that homeowner qualifies for the 26% ITC, so there is still time. Some markets prone to power outages may qualify also for off-grid backup solutions. Majority Report listeners will get a $200 gift card upon installation of their solar system. Go to mysolarnerd.com and fill out the inquiry form now. Make sure you select the Majority Report listener for how you heard about My Solar Nerd to receive that $200 gift card upon installation. That is mysolarnerd.com. Fill out the inquiry form and select the majority report listener so you can get that gift card. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Sarah Matheson. We are back, and we are joined now by Sarah Matheson, Assistant Professor of History and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at GW, and author of Reproduction, Reconceived, Family, Making, and the Limits of Choice after Roe v. Wade. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks. Happy to be here. I I'm happy to discuss your book. It is unfortunately a timely, timely discussion. Um, I highlighted this at the start of the show, but <laughs> Oklahoma just signed a total abortion ban into law, the Republican governor there. And that's one of the many assaults that we're seeing on the right to choose throughout the country. But, you know, your book is it's even more complex than that about the, the concept of choice, honestly. And I found it to be, you know, really important because it intersects capitalism and social safety net um, failures by the United States, et cetera. But I guess let's start uh, with a, the broader question. Um, how, how did Roe v. Wade change everything and how did choice, um, be become such like a hot button term that was also exploited by some of our, our ruling elite, uh, in, in the wake of Roe and it, it, the, the change of, of creating a family, uh, the change of perception of, of making a family as a choice as opposed to an inevitability but that also kind of coincided with uh, a, a shrinking of of prioritizing social proposals. Yeah, thanks for those two very large questions. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think to take the first one about how does Roe change everything? Um, we're used to thinking, I think, about Roe as kind of a, the end all be all of reproductive rights because it is the it is necessary. The right to abortion is necessary to exert full bodily autonomy. And I talk about in the book that 
you know, Roe is kind of the end of a series of changes around norms related to gender, sex, and sexuality that we might, you know, put under the umbrella of the sexual revolution that go towards it securing making possible greater bodily and sexual autonomy so we can think about the right to contraception, but also um, Supreme Court decisions that uh, targeted um, discrimination based on marital status, as well as just things like greater social acceptance for cohabitation before marriage, single motherhood. Um, so Roe kind of comes at the end of all of those things. And we might, I think we are encouraged. We, ha we have been in a habit of thinking about it as the final step to securing bodily autonomy. Um, and distinct from those things that I just mentioned, because it really is the final blow, if you will, to separating motherhood from pregnancy. So as you said in your opening, motherhood or parenting is no longer an, an inevitability, but is turned into a choice. And definitely Roe, along with all of those other shifts, encouraged Americans to think about, um, you know, the, preg the status of pregnancy now becomes the question. You Are you going to continue it or are you going to terminate? Um, and because, you know, the attack on the liberalization of abortion that really starts even before Roe gets so um, intense so quickly after the Roe decision, we have been, you know, the pro-choice movement made a calculation about like, well, how should we defend this right? And, uh, decided to circulate around the idea of pro-choice rather than say pro-abortion. Prior to Roe, it was very common to say things like abortion free and on demand. Obviously the right to choose is a bit uh, more um, palatable. Some might say if they are thinking about how to defend the right to abortion in a hostile climate, um, which was certainly the case in the decades following Roe and especially during um, the Reagan administration. And so we, as a result of that history, have been encouraged to almost treat choice as a euphemism for abortion. Euphemism is the critical way of putting it. We could be more generous and say it's synonymous. Um, and so I, you know, I think that's something listeners can relate to. I really wanted to question that in the book and try to get us to think about the other side of that, because Roe and the other changes that I mentioned absolutely encourage Americans to think about pregnancy as a choice. Um, but the an, an important part and parcel of that, of course, is thinking about having and raising children as a choice as well. And that part of the equation, I think, has gotten less attention just because of the hyper visibility and kind of entrenched nature of the abortion debate in the U.S. And of course, the attack is on people, is trying to limit people's ability to choose one side of that equation, right? And so I understand why the attention right. is there. <clears throat> but to your second question, if Roe makes having and raising children also be thought of and conceptualized as a choice, the conditions in which that happens are really important because as you allude to in your second question, um, this is a moment, Roe is decided at a moment when we are turning to a history that I think we all are quite familiar with as we look back at the last 50 years to try to make sense of the rampant inequality that many of us are living amongst, amidst today. So we, some people call this ne neoliberalism. I prefer to talk about it as state neglect in the book, but we know that from the early 1970s on, um, wealth and economic inequality can starts to um, increase dramatically. There is a retreat of the social welfare state that makes you know everyday people's lives much more difficult. This happens in different ways under different administrations. Reagan, I think, is most well known for kind of the severe state retrenchment and austerity politics that we associate with this period. Of course, um, the Clinton administration is the creator and, and sort of the um, 
the DLC is the creator of the neoliberal third way strategy. Um, and that increases the retrenchment that we see and that I talk about in the book. And Lily Geismer's new book, um, Left Behind, is a really great political history of this development. Um, but it's important to kind of ask ourselves for listeners and viewers, what are the broader conditions in which Roe delivers reproductive choice? What are the other um, supports or lack thereof that exist in order to allow people to uh, be able to meaningfully make a choice? And so I talk about in the book, you know, that a couple of years prior to Roe, um, Nixon had vetoed a bill that would have brought universal child care that had bipartisan support. Um, that happens before Roe's arrival, already kind of setting the stage for what I think can be helpfully described as kind of the state's refusal to participate in the project of family making, like a complete divestment from that very labor and resource intensive um, endeavor. 1973, when Roe was decided, is also what a historian named Judith Stein dubs the age of inequality, kind of getting at these economic shifts, you know, the stagnant and then ever decreasing real value of the wage, inflation, um, the shift in types of employment. So moving from a manufacturing based economy to a service based economy that we now, you know, have seen with the pandemic is uh, such a huge source of jobs and our economy and has like unveiled the quote unquote care crisis um, that the book is really trying to get at in different pockets and in different ways long before the pandemic occurred. Um, so I think that to sort of wrap up your two questions, Roe changes everything because it seems to deliver reproductive choice but it is then put under immediate attack that makes accessing abortion very difficult. And the conditions in which it arrives, where we see this immense divestment on the part of federal and municipal and state government for any types of services that would help people actually make ends meet as they endeavor to have and raise and create families, um, is also on the decline and under attack. And so whether you are, a, we are now in a situation, as you said at the top of the show, um, we are now in a situation in which it is incredibly becoming increasingly more difficult to choose to terminate a pregnancy. And of course, if you can't choose to terminate a pregnancy, it means you're not choosing the conditions in which you have a child. And we are also in a situation in which those conditions are um, incredibly challenging for a greater and greater share of the population. So I wanted to touch on the the Nixon example that that you listed there because I think it's just it's such a a microcosm of, of a lot of the dynamics here. But specifically, how um, you know that there was a real genuine fear among conservatives and you know just the ruling elite that uh, that that more women in the workforce, you know, it would not, it, it would uh, bring about the downfall of the nuclear family and thus like the right to choose in this instance is uh, a way to control them to a degree. And that's why he vetoes childcare, right? Because if you have broader access to those programs, then women have more freedom, more ability to choose what they want to do with their time, I guess, in theory. But the, the kinds of women that this ends up actually benefiting when Roe does pass uh, are already economically mobile women, white women to a degree. And so certain women are left behind and are affected even more dramatically by Democrats largely abandoning any uh, broader social vision like, you know, was happening in the decade previously, starting in the 70s, and then, of course, devolves entirely with, with Bill Clinton representing that. Um, so I, I guess, uh, can, can you just talk a little bit about that example, expand on the Nixon example as a microcosm of a lot of how um, 
social perceptions of motherhood and control of women spilled over into more austerity politics and neglect, as you say, in terms of social spending when it came to childcare and other related issues? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, you know, you are absolutely right that part of the, um, part of the, the reason that Nixon is advised by sort of conservative um, political advisors to ultimately veto the bill is due to misogyny, that the, that there is, um, it is a fundamental attack on what we, on what society at that point would perceive to be women's traditional role, though it's worth noting, as you said, that that role mostly extended um, to middle-class women and of course motherhood in the US has always sort of been um, only a vaunted and romanticized and cherished role for white middle-class women. Um, we have not we have not extended the same kind of very confusing combination of romanticization followed by no actual valuation to um, poor women of color in their roles as mothers. So absolutely misogyny is a part of it, but it's also part of just a broader project that comes to be, you know, I think people maybe will be familiar with the term of family values that the conservative um, shift that happens, that starts happening in the 1970s and kind of Reagan is the, the successful arrival of that strategy. Um, that they build their power with. And so that means, you know, it's a backlash to the feminist movement. It's a backlash to the gay and lesbian liberation movement. It's a backlash to the civil rights movement. So the various more um, liberal and left social movements that you referred to that really um, have major visibility and pressure in the late 1960s as kind of the apex of that, um, Certainly the conservative response with this idea of family values that feminists are trying to overtake the family, gays and lesbians are trying to overtake the family, um, that that is a direct response to those movements. And um, part of, you know, I think the child care bill is, is, it illustrates the logics of that approach because it's easy, I think, to treat those, that development as kind of like, like sometimes that gets bundled as, oh, well, that's like part of the culture wars, like gender and sexuality and reproduction live over here. And, you know, the economy lives over here. But as people have shown that political strategy of the family values had a very significant economic agenda, which was the austerity that you mentioned. And so it, we can think of the child care bill as like this moment as in which um, sometimes people will refer to this as the privatization of the family, where the government, the conservatives in government that are advising Nixon are saying, you know, government is actually the problem. Um, government intrusion, intrusion into the intimate realm of the family is uh, would be something too close to socialism or communism. Of course, there's a lot of like um, red baiting that is part of this strategy. And that argument allows for there to be very little social welfare spending in those realms. And so I think it's important to kind of, um, and people have, historians have illustrated how the arguments against kind of the, you know, <laughs> framing government as a threat to the family rather than as something that could help make family easier for the vast majority of people um, is both an ideological and, you know, like economic argument in one that has been really devastating. I mean, another example that we can look at for the 1970s is the debate over a guaranteed basic income that the National Welfare Rights Organization was at the forefront of. And, you know, I think with um, 
with like the two uh, Bernie campaigns, maybe a guaranteed basic income is more on the minds of some people, but I think it's still kind of a really hard thing for a lot of people to wrap their minds around. But during that period, um, it was not so controversial or kind of unimaginable. Um, it was not ultimately successful, but the National Welfare Rights Organization was really a key player in, in helping people think about not only that the government might secure, be, be the responsible party for securing people's basic necessities and that we could kind of like undetach or untangle um, living from working, right? Living to make a wage or sorry, working to make a living. Um, we could kind of untangle that, but also for like a feminist component that, you know, welfare mothers actually were already doing work that in the home, raising their children, that that was a valuable contribution to society. And so what's not the matter? Contribution to a capitalist. So it doesn't have that value. Right. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they, that's one way to narrate it, but I think that the NWRO is an early manifestation of a socialist feminist argument that says actually it's quite beneficial and a valuable contribution to capitalism because it's reproducing the labor force for no wage at all. You're kind of getting, if we use the traditional breadwinner model, which is almost non-existent at this point, and you have a male breadwinner, that wage supposedly, right, is to the family wage is supposed to allow him to provide for his entire family. Socialist feminists like the Wages for Housework campaign in the 1970s would say, well, actually, that wage, you're getting like two workers for the price of one because the housewife, assuming that someone makes enough to be able to have only a single income, is reproducing that male worker so that he can return to work the next day, as well as reproducing future workers that will enter the labor market. Um, and that's really kind of a key insight that I wanted to operate from in the book uh, to say, like, if we take if we take as our starting point this idea from socialist feminists that reproductive labor is actually incredibly valuable, if invisible, if not paid enough, even when it is per performed in the marketplace, um, and if we pair that with the fact that we are looking at a period in which the state has divested so greatly um, what additional labors were people forced to do just to be able to reproduce and maintain their families? And that was really kind of a key question. Right. And, and I, I mean, that made me think even harder to, too about what we've talked about in the debates about Build Back Better. One of the last things to go before it ended was universal child care. And part of that was because that liberates certain, uh, I'm using that ironically, but it, it, it that allows for uh, certain uh, often women to get back out there and get back into the workforce. Um, and, and so even though Build Back Better did die and universal child care would be a good thing, you understand why maybe that's more uh, tantalizing to certain business interests and also lawmakers than as opposed to like, you know, universal health care, for example, when they can't use that to to. Uh, hang over a worker's head in labor negotiations, for example. Um, but I, but I also just want to talk about and move on to the, the, the mass incarceration element, because as Nixon axes universal child care, as, you know, Roe is about to happen, um, the war on drugs also starts to happen under Nixon. And this is the beginning of our mass incarceration state. And so that begins to break up disproportionately black and brown families, um, you know, and and the income inequality begins to widen. Social safety nets begin to dissolve and get uh, cut harshly, especially later in the 80s and 90s as well. Um, how did that contribute to the lack of choice in this post row -Ro era that you write about? Yeah, thanks for bringing up that that element of the book. 
so, you know, part of how the book is organized is trying, as I mentioned earlier, trying to think about, um, okay, if we leave the traditional places that I think this debate over work, quote, again, a euphemism of work-life balance takes place, which is kind of like the conflict between the home and the workplace. How are you going to work in both places at once? And that's what I think the debate some of the debate over Build Back Better and also the pandemic made clear to people. If we, if we, okay, we acknowledge that those are really key places that that debate unfolds. What if we also look beyond that to think about what other aspects of, what other political developments during this period um, came to press upon families and make it harder for that, for family making to be done successfully. And one of the chapters examines the or the early period of mass incarceration, um, sort of the origins of mass incarceration and how um, incarcerated women get one, right, as you mentioned, separated from their families. So there's sort of an immediate break of any, um, Material familial ties in the day to day, but also the legal, the sort of custodial consequences of that incarceration. Um, so the idea that that many people have documented both past and in our current moment of uh, and it, a conviction and a prison sentence, or or even like a stint in jail that you can't get out of because you can't afford to post bail, which is why so many, especially the, the vast majority of people who are in jail who have not yet been even convicted for a crime are Black women who are the primary caretakers of small children um, because they can't afford to post bail, um, then that has legal consequences for your ability to maintain custody of your child. And so the chapter is kind of trying to explore early um, instances of that, looking at a major pres federal prison in California. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to note that um, prisons obviously are the site of immense violence. Um, they are punitive institutions, and a lot of work has been done on that. Um, I wanted to kind of add to that conversation that there's also rampant neglect that happens within those institutions that has had immediate kind of sort of devastating consequences for people's ability to participate in family making. So whether that's medical neglect that leaves pregnant people who are incarcerated um, without any adequate medical care, during their pregnancy and, you know, despite repeated kind of attempts to alert of correctional officials um, or correctional officers that something is wrong, that medical intervention coming too late and having something like um, delivery of a stillborn in prison, which is something that the chapter talks about, or kind of the more, that's kind of like this immediate, like, indifference or neglect on the part of people inside of the prison, or we can zoom out to kind of the structural failures of um, public agencies talking to one another in order to make sure that people can show up, for example, at court dates that relate to their custody of their children while they're incarcerated, um, and people never being informed that that is something that they need to show up to. Um, and that having, you know, permanent consequences in terms of loss of custody and even to more of like the day to day, how do you maintain a relationship with someone um, with a small child when you can't spend time with them or see them regularly? And so getting at kind of the environment of something like a prison or a jail and the ways that there is just no infrastructure whatsoever to make meaningful visitation and the nurturance and maintenance of familial ties that is such an important part of social reproduction possible. And so that chapter spends a lot of time looking at a group that attempted to build such an infrastructure inside of the federal prison um, that I examine and kind of like the 
the heroic efforts that such a project took because so much of as I'm sure will be familiar to viewers and listeners, you know, so much of that work had to be done on the part of advocates on the outside, as well as their counterparts on the inside, with little support from the institution itself, saying, you know, yes, we're going to rubber stamp, we're going to green light this, and this can go forward. But in terms of funding, in terms of the time and energy it took to make um, a robust kind of supportive and child-friendly environment within the confines of a violent, neglectful institution was immense and not something that officials had much part in. Um, and ultimately, as the effects of more punitive sentencing laws, um, the increase in the prison population, as that came to press on that prison and sort of disrupted the very tenable, I mean, sorry, the very um, uh, insecure and kind of precarious in infrastructure yeah. that yeah. advocates had built, like that came, you know, crumbling down. And so those solutions are always quite uh, insecure, I think. Of course. I mean, you know, it's like just advocates can only do so much without, without state systems. Um, and so I, I we're we're running out of time shortly, and I didn't. I, I want to at least touch on the your your focus on LGBTQ uh, mothers or parents, and and the complete lack of infrastructure or social safety nets there. So it's a bit of a hard transition, but I want to make sure we we ex we explored that element of your book, if you don't mind expanding on that. Yeah, totally. No worries. Um, so another place that the book wanted to that I really wanted to look at was the. Um, sort of some, you can think of it as like two things. Where is family making happen happening that we might not immediately think that it's happening? And also who is participating in family making that traditionally, historically had not done so before. And so I think this chapter falls in that latter category of looking at specifically lesbians who decided to try to um, use artificial insemination to pursue pregnancy and family on their own terms. And often that expressly meant um, creating fatherless families. And, um, you know, I think viewers, maybe viewers and listeners might be familiar with um, maybe vaguely that history, right? Like a part, part of a, a, the preceding, at least one preceding kind of um, element to the arrival of gay marriage is the existence of gay and lesbian and queer families who wanted that legal recognition of being quote unquote real families recognized by the state um, who wanted to have their um, commitment to one another legally recognized. And so it's probably not a surprise that like there is the history of gay and lesbian family making um, but what I try to kind of add to that conversation or change the way, ask people to kind of change the way they think about that history, um, is that lesbians who were engaging in artificial insemination during this period to create reproductive autonomy, um, they had to do so without the help of the clinic and certainly without any legal recognition for the families that resulted from artificial insemination because physicians wouldn't treat, they wouldn't help single women, gay or not, get pregnant through artificial insemination. Um, and the law just like had never even considered that a lesbian might also be a mother without the you know, attendant co-partner of a father. And so I try to chart kind of the social and legal barriers that lesbians who were doing this in the 1970s encountered. And um, one of the things that I think is important to highlight is that the kind of unexpected barrier that a lot of lesbians encountered was not necessarily um, the homophobia of saying, you know, you shouldn't be able to raise this child because you're gay, which there is a history of that discrimination that is kind of happening in the 1960s and 70s that many gays and lesbians were denied custody of their children on the basis of like gays not being fit to parent. 
this generation that comes after and is creating families through artificial insemination um, by donor, right? You just need a sperm donor. It's actually quite, many women found it quite easy to um, successfully get pregnant using that donor, that sperm donor. Um, and what they find is that once uh, they apply to get welfare to help them through the early period of having just delivered um, a child, that the state becomes very interested in identifying a male provider. And so while a lot of the discussion amongst lesbians was fears of, well, what if we make, we get a donor who says he doesn't want to be involved and then he changes his mind? How do we protect against that? I trace the legal advocacy that tries to mitigate the, the like shore up women's legal custody claims if that happened. I also talk about these cases where what triggers donor involvement is actually state mandated involvement for the purposes of having someone besides, you know, the municipal government paying that welfare check. And so there, to me, you know, there's a lot of unfinished business for queer families who are not going through the now available legal routes, whether that's marriage, whether that's making sure you have a contract between you and your donor, really, whether that's like you're middle class and you have enough economic security to kind of shield your family from state involvement, which is really kind of, I think, what the chapter illuminates that there's a lot of queer families who and not queer families, of course, who don't have those resources and therefore don't kind of have the right to privacy from state intervention in what their family formations will look like. And um, I think that's an important part of what the chapter is trying to do. Yeah, uh, it's well said. And I really appreciate your time today. Sarah Matheson, Assistant Professor of History and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at George Washington University and author of Reproduction Reconceived, Family Making and the Limits of Choice after Roe v. Wade. Sarah, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It was great. Agreed. All right, folks, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program. Um, we're going to be taking your calls in the fun half, 646-257-3920. So uh, give us a call. Tell us what's on your mind. We'll chat with you. I'm um, reading some IMs. You can IM, IM into the show by downloading the Majority Report app. But first, Matt, Left Reckoning was last night. No, it is actually oh, tonight. Oh, it's tonight. It's Wednesday today. Oh, um, my God. Today's Wednesday. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, tonight God. we got uh, Kurt Hackbarth. He's a writer on Mexican politics. He's often Jacobin. We're talking about the uh, nationalization of the electric grid that AMLO is uh, undertaking and the uh, right-wing attacks against him, and also the think tank, uh, right-wing think tank complex in Mexico. So that's tonight, patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. I was actually thinking of you last night because the Timberwolves game was on. I know you're, you know, you're a fan too. Would you, yeah. Yeah, right. oh yeah, I would say if I have a favorite team, which I, I'm, I'm pretty, um, uh, what's the word? Um, Transient? Yeah, transient works. I was, I was going to use one about... Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, Timberwolves are probably my favorite team. Um, pretty good game last night. I'm very happy about uh, the performance of Anthony Edwards and D'Angelo Russell. Yeah. Uh, the Carl Anthony Towns dynamic of it makes me feel worried about losing to Milwaukee or uh, uh, Memphis in about five games. Yeah, no, I just... I, uh, I, I, my point is that I... Saw the you know I was watching the game last night. I was like, "Damn, Matt's gonna miss this because he's shooting left reckoning." Yeah, I do miss a lot of basketball because we do. <laughs> but it wasn't Wednesday. actually Wednesday. Yeah. But yeah, but even like typically, like Wednesday is the usually the heaviest night for NBA schedule, and mm. I'm broadcasting right through it. Ah, well. Anyway, um, have to change I, that for next season, maybe. Yes, uh, that they should listen to you and and change it up. But um, I'm saying me and David could change it, but maybe Adam Silver can. Yeah, no, no, no. It's what uh, Adam Silver figuring it out is easier than you guys changing your schedule. We have, we have priorities here. All right, six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. 
three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now. And I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now. And I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. Who? Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight? Yes. Hi, me? This me? Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go start Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857-210-35-501-1-half. 9-11, for instance. $3,400, $1,900. $6,543 trillion sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes, it's satire. On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, like yeah. everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Um, Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, this, this, um, gotta jump. Gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. Uh, um, Two o'clock. We're already late. And the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Back. We are back. We're going to take some calls, chat with you all. Is choir, is choir des meho, ho, oh, uh, left is, is care best. Is meho- care- right. Yikes. Emma, you're killing it, running with everything, um, you do keep it up matt as well doing it expertly from the wings and bradley cleaning up the back end all right thanks mopping up jason schreier of bloomberg has just reported that one of the lawyers involved in the activision blizzard lawsuit has resigned because the governor of california gavin newsom is interfering with the case to defend the company and fired the lawyer's boss activision blizzard you know the guys who sexually harassed their female co-workers and employees and such Vile ways that a padlock had to be placed on a fridge because executives were drinking the breast milk of new mothers that was being stored there. Oh, my God. I don't know enough about this case, but uh, we'll look into that a little bit more. That's yeah, I don't nuts. know about that um, that sort of internal politics thing. But, yeah, Activision, bad place. Below me, do you call Sam, oh, captain, my captain? No. Um, Sarah from Mar, uh, Sarah from Arkansas really, uh, love the guests and topic today. The right sees our history as a war on the traditional women, but it's just project projection. The real wars against women's progress and liberation from having to exist to serve men. Also, um, another author who writes about the struggle who I recommend for the show is may I, uh, the tone of face. Okay. 
I'm just tr trying to make sure that you didn't get me to say anything inappropriate there. Um, Ob Obamagate Hotel Plumber. One thing that occasionally comes up, especially in New York City, is the whining about how the federal government isn't doing enough to support the houseless and insecure. But the federal support we do have is SNAP, Social Security, Disability, WIC, TANF, Medicaid, etc. All typically work a lot better when the recipient has a permanent address they can be reached at. Exactly. Aside from the other benefits, guaranteed housing means more federal support can flow to the poor. Great point. Calling from a 304 number. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Ren. Can you hear me? Hey, Ren. How are you? Yes. Give me one sec, please. Sure. If I had the soundboard, I'd play the elevator music, but I do not. Okay, I'm outside now. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the um, rapidly deteriorating situation with trans rights and a lot of these bills that are getting passed. Yes. Uh, a few days ago, the uh, bill in Alabama, SB 184, passed, which forcibly detransitions all teenagers in the state. And there is a bill up in Mississippi that does the same thing. Uh, there was a situation in Maryland where they had a two-thirds Democratic majority and they were trying to pass an Equal Health Care Act to, you know, give protections to trans people. And it passed committee, but they did not even bring it to the floor to receive a vote. And then tried to tell people saying, hey, this is fucked, that they were Monday morning quarterbacking. Um, and then they, like, completely removed any history of the committee vote or, like, the two-hour hearing surrounding it. And now there is not even a record of it having existed on Ballopedia. And it's, I don't know. It's Jesus. Fun. It like, is. Even Democratic majorities are not good enough for us. Like, uh, uh. there was also, um, I wanted to talk about your guests and also about the media a bit. Sure. I, I, I expect to not see this on ABC. I expect to not see this on CNN in terms of these bills. But, like, where the fuck is John Oliver? Like, no offense. I love the guy. He's done a lot of great... He's done a lot of great stuff, and he's great for getting people kind of funneled into, like, a left pipeline. But, like, what the fuck, man? This has been going on for a month and a half, and this dude is talking about ticket prices and ticket gouging mm -hmm. in instead of, like, kids dying. And uh, I think there's I a lot of, like, a lot of lack of uh, gumption or, like, there's a lot of people who still haven't like fully come around and understand trans issues in the way that like meets the moment right now so i hear you on that and and these bills also, and the assault on on trans kids also in regards to your guests there's like also been a very long history that still continues of denying trans parents uh the right to have custody of their children through the fact that they're trans um my aunt my aunt, who's the only person that I keep contact with in my family, is a gay trans woman, and she has had to testify multiple times in family court as to why being trans does not disqualify her from being a mother or mm -hmm. being able to have custody of her child. And it's fucking ridiculous and humiliating having to try to go up and have to make the case as to why you being who you are isn't a mental illness that means you're a threat to the kid. It's... Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, it's it's terrifying and awful, but thank you for the update, Ren, as always. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Just the, the thing that we need to do is we need to be organizing on the ground and we need to be having people run for office. I mean, like, it, it's going to take a while. It, my generation it isn't at a point where we can really do much about it yet, but there are a lot of people in their mid to late 20s, early 30s that might not think that they can participate in the political system in that way that maybe should. Yeah, 100%. Um, appreciate it. Best wishes for Sam. You're doing great. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Um, I want to talk a bit more about those bills in a little bit. We have some sound, right? Don't we, Bradley, of some of that anti-trans stuff? Yeah, the uh, Tennessee clip. Oh my gosh, you sound so much better. Yeah. Because I'm not slurring my words. No, no. <laughs> uh, Bradley's finally hooked into the board so he can hear himself. <laughs> so many people in the chat are like, stop slurring, Bradley. You're too excited. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm excited <laughs> for you, to be honest. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want to get to this Fox and Friends clip uh, right off the bat if we have it. Um, 
so Fox and Friends, uh, they've been hammering home how dangerous and scary it is for them at uh, News Corp in Midtown Manhattan. Um, and so they're using this opportunity, this very scary subway shooting, to uh, kick homeless people. They're, they're going to critique, I think, Eric Adams about this, but Eric Adams is essentially saying the same thing uh, on uh, on cable news this morning. But here, they take an interesting angle in which they agree with some of the alleged shooters' anti-homeless rants. That's a bold strategy. Let's see how it pays. <laughs> works out for you. Point earlier, uh, the the homeless guy, rather They're all uh, Frank James, and leaving Steve. For, they don't want to be no, cops anymore. No, I, I absolutely understand. But uh, Frank James on his videos, and keep in mind, unclear if he is a suspected gunman. Uh, he was talking about the homeless problem on the subway. He said, you know, you, there was no place to sit because the cars were full of homeless people. So That's that was true, one of the actually. things that motivated him. That's true, him. actually. Is that what? Is he the gunman? Is that what motivated him? Stay tuned there. You know, it's an all points bulletin. Everybody trying to find this guy. Yeah, Mayor de Blasio thought it was a good idea to leave the homeless on the trains and let them be, become apartment buildings. Uh, so the big thing is about the homeless. You don't look at them and say, that family of four couldn't make rent. You look at them and say, this guy is nuts. And that's what I see. I'm on the subway four days a week. And I can't tell you how many guys you look at him and go, that is uh, an aggressive person mm -hmm. that you do not want to turn your back on. So say this shooter was a Muslim person who had posted about the way that America had conducted its foreign policy as a motivation for their, um, for their assault in the subway. Would we be hearing any commentary that's sympathetic with their motives? Would it be a, well, they were out just asking for it. I mean, that was, uh, that's the equivalent of what they were saying there. I mean, he's right about that is what Ainsley said. That's true, actually, about some of his, you know, deranged motivations, allegedly, if he is the person who ended up being the shooter, who, uh, for, for wreaking havoc and violence on the subway. But he also... Uh, in some of his ravings, talked about how 9-11 was a good thing, uh, was anti-Semitic in a lot of his uh, rants, also anti-Black, spoke about prostitutes. I mean, the guy has issues, obviously. And yet they're trying to, like, you know, expand on his murderous motivation here as coming from so some sort of kernel of truth. Th th this is how right-wingers and, you know, s center-right, figures like Eric Adams want to respond to this un unspeakable violence here. How can we use this as a way to further buttress our desire to kick the most vulnerable people in our city? Well, and why uh, do we keep producing vulnerable people at such a, and broken, sort of mentally broken people at such a high rate? It's because we're not dealing with the actual root cause of these issues. And going after the people who are bearing the brunt of our lack of willingness to deal with root causes or create some sort of social safety net, guarantee housing. So that, as the I am wrote in, some of these homeless people would have a permanent address to receive benefits from the federal government that could help them, which are already threadbare as is, potentially, though they could get Medicaid healthcare, et cetera, like they, they, they don't want to actually systemically change anything. In fact, they would love if taxes were lowered and social programs were slashed even further. So that's why they have to demonize the people as opposed to acknowledge the conditions that create that kind of insecurity. It's just, it's such a scary, dangerous game. And again, as Matt mentioned earlier in the show, violence against homeless people is is a huge problem in and of itself. And the demonization of them is not going to help. Yeah. And I mean, I just want to just to get his, um, just to quote him on what he said about homeless people. He, this is from the New York Post article. He also criticized the mayor for not doing more to combat homelessness. I mean, I don't know what he wants Eric Adams to do at this point. I mean, Eric Adams, no, this oh. is the, the, 
Frank James. Oh, Frank James. Sorry. Eric Adams. Uh, what are you doing, brother? What's happening with this homeless situation? He said while referring to the subway, every car I went into was loaded with homeless people. It was so bad. I couldn't even stand. I had to keep moving from car to car. So just the kill me, like basically kill me's complaint. Yeah. Because he, he, his illness is seemingly manifesting itself in hating groups of people. <laughs> And he includes the homeless in that. And, like, that's indistinguishable from what Fox says on a daily basis with, like, ethnic groups and then also with homeless people as well. You just you give people a new new person to hate, to hide, hide you know, where power truly really lies. Also, there's no way Kilmeade rides the subway, right? <laughs> Four times a day. There's, Four days a week. There's really no shocked. way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'll I'd just be pretty sure to see if anyone saw him on the subway. But I, I'd be very impressed, frankly, if Ryan Kilmeade's riding the subway. I mean, maybe if he's coming down to, you know, whatever, 57th and Lex from uh, 63rd and Lex, maybe. I, I mean, it, it's it's not that scary coming from the Upper East Side down to Midtown. It's, it's a 10-minute commute. Could happen, but I would guess that in the pandemic in particular, Brian Kilmeade was taking a private car. Just a guess. Yeah, and I just think it's weird, like, um, Lee Fong and Glenn Greenwell are talking about now how he's a black identity extremist. And I don't know, like, what, like, like, like he's got some conflicting things, I guess we should say, about blackness. He's a black guy himself, apparently. Um, but, uh, like, says, you know, like, it basically confused things about, like, um, we don't, like, conflating, like, how black people are treated with how much backup um, people are given Zelensky, right? So he's a, he's a mentally challenged guy. And I, yeah. the idea that this is about, would if you're going to say like an ideology is something is, is um, sort of at play here, I don't think whatever bl the FBI tells us about black and extremist extremism is the most interesting one. Um, I think mental health is probably the number one thing. And also I think like this guy is in his own words uh, said that there's too many homeless people on the subway and then shot a bunch of people on the subway. So like, I feel like that's maybe the more concerning um thing we need to look about look at in the discourse right now mm -hmm. instead of on cable news saying he's right about that actually yeah which validating yeah. it uh, and those people think it's valid yeah <laughs> and like if it was a cop that uh shot some homeless person they'd be fine with that i mean yeah frocks why is Fox News still in NYC? Shouldn't they be in a small town, Texas, or small town, Florida? Oh, they're still working on it. Custodial artists. Yes, Emma, but why are they homeless? Yeah, right. Might be the lack of homes. Majority Report wardrobe coordinator. Brian Kilmeade is on the subway four times a week. Fun fact, subway is what Kilmeade calls his car and driver. Yes. Um, Sam's fathomable consort. Hi, Emma. Now that you've ousted Sam, will you be looking for new ways with which to update the tired, broken format of the old show? If so, I suggest a segment called Cashew Corner, where you snack on your favorite cashews and talk about your 10 sports picks. I mean, Sam will only will usually talk about apples for 10 minutes, so I think that's only fair. Well, I'll show the cashews I have here. I have lightly salted planters that I got at Dwayne Reed. Halves and pieces. Not an ad. Not an ad. But I mean, like, you can't really go wrong. And these are not as expensive as, like, when I go to Trader Joe's. It's just, you know, I, I just, it's it's fine to get the, although maybe, I don't know, maybe are these not, I wonder where these come from. Maybe I should look into, like, the, the environmental differences between cashew brands. Hmm. I have some bad news. Uh, Kill me does ride the subway. Um, verification. And this, this is in the line of also don't, um, don't be too don't don't assume that people are lying about being vaccinated also like um but kill me is the proof here is there's a media article of our buddies the good liars uh heckling uh brian kill until he gets onto the subway there are a lot of wealthy people that ride the subway yeah i exactly. mean it, it just I mean, espe especially if you... tyson famously right right i uh i al roker was on a, in the same car as me recently not recently god that was three years ago it was right before the pandemic jesus maybe not three whatever um let's take another call calling from a 216 number who's this where you calling from hey this is steven from pittsburgh 
Steven from Pittsburgh, what's on your mind? Uh, just two quick shout outs. Um, one with uh, sort of piggybacking off of Ren's call, uh, this one specifically with abortion. Um, the Pittsburgh DSA is doing a fundathon for the larger Western PA Fund for Choice um, fundathon. Uh, specifically, it's a uh, it's an abortion fund that goes to one of the providers in the area that handles a lot of out of state abortions, uh, since PA tends to be a little less restrictive uh, than some of our neighbors. So I just wanted to let people know that they can, uh, you can donate directly to the Western PA Fund for Choice, um, but if you go through DSA, they're one of the teams for it. Um, so that sort of like is a two for one because it also helps uh, give them exposure for um, doing this uh, this fundraiser. Right. Um, can, the URL. Can you say it again? Yeah, the, the URL. URL. What is it? Yeah. So it's slightly complicated. It's fund dot n n a fund dot n n a f dot org slash abortions a b o r t y i n z abort yuns yins because yeah, yeah I gotcha i gotcha yeah <laughs> um we're, we're gonna pull that up now just so people know where to go um yeah, they're about halfway to their goal right now. They're at 5,000 out of 10,000. And the larger fund is uh, at 18 out of 25. Um, okay. Yeah. And then uh, real quick, last thing I wanted to shout out is the... the here it is up on that, the on per- the uh, full screen, though, Abortians here. Per- perfect. Okay, awesome. gotcha. So people um, can look that up. And then just uh, keep an eye on uh, the Pittsburgh Starbucks Worker United Twitter, the first store that filed is counting their votes as we speak oh my god right now they had nice yeah so they had uh they had a zoom link out but i uh the lady kicked me off the call because i guess it's not open for the public but so i think they delayed the zoom link but the uh their twitter account should announce the results here i don't expect it to take too too long but um okay yeah that was it all right well i appreciate it steven thank you for the updates and for the info that people can check out Absolutely. Thanks, Emma. Bye. Between the 101 and the 5, why are all these people sleeping on the subway? Get a home. Jesus. It's the in quotes. Kojo's bald head. Adam Fox rides the subway. Oh, it's because he's the man, of the man of the people. I mean, another homeless policy we just started doing is remove. I mean, maybe, I mean, we probably have been doing it, but redoubled efforts toward is not letting homeless people sleep on the vents of subway exhaust on streets yeah because it's too warm too cozy i guess i don't know like you need the air to be able to escape or something like that and so um uh yeah like rather than giving them a warm place to stay it's let's just move them to uh, some other place less visible or anti-homeless architecture where there's like needless um armrests on park benches or dividers so that they're unable to lay down it's sick. Custodial artist. I used to work in the rehabilitation field, and I've heard countless times that before COVID in the upstate area, there was a two-year waiting list for semi-permanent homes, let alone a permanent one. Left is best. <clears throat> All right, let's 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 turn to this DeSantis clip. Um, on Monday, Ron DeSantis signed a law that would, quote, support programs that encourage involved fatherhood. So, like, this is an anti-black piece of legislation, most likely. It's just a way to, um, to, to uh, launder it's, racist rhetoric through legislation. I mean, yeah, it's, it's to culturally pathologize poor people. Yes. Particularly, like. Yeah, non white. And um, here he is speaking about the crisis of fatherhood in the country. If you look over the last many decades, uh, one of the Pause worst it. social trends. Is that Tony Dungy? No, it's not. It's okay. It's really unclear for me. I'm sorry. 
if you right, look over the last many decades, uh, one of the worst social trends uh, has been the decline of fatherhood. And we do have, in many instances, a, a fatherhood crisis in this country. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, when you take kids that do not have a Pause father it. present, it is Tony Dungy. All right, start it over. <laughs> yep, yeah, uh, just controlled F that Tampa Bay Times article about it. He's, he's yep, right that, in there. <laughs> it doesn't shock me because uh, he's he's o- often, I, I feel like, involved in some of these, like... Didn't he have, like, personal of... tragedy or something like that with his kid dying or something? I don't know. Depressing. Yeah, depressing that he's being used in this way. But, I mean, look, he has agency, too, so uh, start over. <laughs> in this country. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, when you take kids that do not have a father present during their upbringing, the chance of them dropping out of school, uh, getting involved in trouble with the law, having other difficulties increases dramatically. Uh, and I think it's been very, very obvious uh, that when fathers are present, when they're uh, serving a productive, helping to, to Keep their kids in line when, uh, when they're not. Um, it makes a, a real impact. So, yeah, this this legislation, I mean, here's here's what it involves. And you can take what you will from this. HB 7065, a $70 million initiative, will provide resources for educational and mentorship programs to help children, fathers, and families in the state through the Department of Juvenile Justice and the Department of Children's and Children and Families. DJJ will create a mentorship program to help at-risk youth through the new initiative, hosting various programs such as barbershop talks and fatherhood classes. So as Matt said, that is a way to, it's just really a way that's not that expensive for Florida's standards, a $70 million program to uh, create initiatives that will largely be empty. Um, but it's a way for DeSantis to continue to pad his electoral profile for when he does run for president um, and uh, use this on the campaign trail to see, you know, where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? Uh, I'm going to it's a continuation of anti-black tropes for decades at this point. There's uh, there's the number one place, uh, number one sort of thing that's removing fathers from the home where they could be spending time with their children is the workplace. Uh, there's one way to make this program uh, actually worth a damn, which would be to if all of those, all this money was going to uh, paying fathers basically a job uh, for being in like their, they should get a stipend for like going. Like remember that clip or we for had childcare. about childcare. Remember that clip we had about like the dads in the hall or whatever, yes. or whatever. And it's like, look at this is what we need fathers like to be in their kids' lives, and the, that's an insidious thing because like at, on on one level it's absolutely true that. It would be great if fathers had more time um, to spend with their kids. The implication in our society, which is extremely racist, is that they don't want to be there because they're out doing unproductive things, right. as Ron DeSantis says. But what they're actually doing is serving a boss or trying to make ends meet, typically. Like, and that and that is the number. Like, and in poorer communities, and especially because they've been targeted by mass incarceration, sometimes they're broken up because, like, the state has decided to criminalize poverty. Yeah, and your ability to like earn is really hampered by things like a criminal record yeah um and so like those are the things that are really um standing in people's way and so like if we had this situation where florida is going to pay fathers a stipend so they only need to work three days a week and can go spend time mentoring their kids uh that'd be great uh, instead what this is going to be is like this is like the flip side of um it's a pr like, campaign yeah it's like corporate anti-racism like, yes. this is the republican version of that it's it's a it's an expensive uh uh PR initiative for DeSantis's conservative uh, bona fides. And so, I mean, like, in a, if this was alongside programs like the ones that Matt is describing, it would not necessarily be a bad thing, even though I don't love, like, the way it's worded in the undertones, et cetera. Exactly. Of like- barbership shop talks. I mean, we understand what they're trying to do here. Yeah. Um, but but the the issue is is that like this is a way to make it seem like if only we educate certain populations then they'll be good fathers as opposed it's a culture to, problem I, right as opposed to this is the result of our complete abandonment of social programs that would allow for those kinds of conditions so thank you Ron DeSantis for wasting your uh, everybody's time and money um, on this. 
and Jesus Christ, Tony Junji. It's sad. It'd be great. It'd be great for families if parents only had to work three days a week. Yeah. Um, Jamil Hill spoke out against Tony. I'm trying to like at the same time read some of this about Tony Dungy's involvement, but you know. Yeah, done. so he has he apparently has eleven kids with his wife, um, eight adopted, three biological, but his his He's very one religious, of, right? One of his sons committed suicide in two thousand five. So that's, that's a that, yeah, to, to your point, Matt, that's the that's the tragedy, yeah. Yeah, he's very religious. He's been um but I mean, uh, he, he. I think in 2014 he was saying that uh, he wouldn't have drafted Michael Sam because he was gay. So, okay. like that's that speaks to to some of where Don- Dungey's coming from here. I mean, that it really is like the uh, Jonathan Isaac too. Speaking of a Florida-based uh, um, uh, black conservative, who turns out it's a lot to do with religion. The option where you don't get laid. Trump pretty much did his Mexicans are rapists last week at a rally. DeSantis has to amp up the racism. Yeah. Santa Paul is that Tony groomed his gay son to hate himself. And okay. I didn't know that that was the situation. Oh, gosh. I, that is horrible if that's true. Um, Rose Coded. Left his best. We will be donating money to strike funds at the end of every year. Woo! I don't know who we is, but that's awesome. Ro- oh, here it is. Hey, uh, Mr. We have a new Yorker, uh, new worker co-op. One person, one vote. We provide tech services from web development to business intelligence and so much more. Rosecoded.com. We are made up of socialists, people of color, trans folks, cis women and men, neurodivergent folks, disabled folks. We've got all the kinds of folks except capitalists, and th- you'll be donating money to strike funds at the end of every year. That's awesome. Well, I still need to hear what your body mass index is. Are, so. <laughs> that you're not eligible for the bonus if you don't uh, get on that. 10,000 uh, steps a day. What's the spell? What's the spelling? Rosecoded.com. Yes. Uh, you want to do this Grassley thing? Yeah, I just think it's interesting. Okay. Um, so Chuck Grassley spoke at a town hall back uh, speaking to his constituents. He was asked here by one of his constituents whether Republicans will vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act again, uh, again and they'll try this effort. Which Grassley has voted for over a dozen times. Right. Um, it was only saved by John McCain which might have been some sort of strategic way to uh, for Republicans to have their cake and eat it too a little bit, look like they're opposing Obamacare because Obama's in the name very vociferously. But in the end, hey, the private marketplace kind of likes it. So maybe we don't want to go all the way in that uh, uh, in repealing it. And here he is saying to this constitu- uh, constituent that they won't try to do so. Um, my concern is with the Affordable Care Act, yep. and I understand now that there are like 23 million uh, people on the Affordable Care Act, and two of those happen to be my adult children. And um, I noticed in the Cedar Rapids Gazette that you voted um, 12 times to try to repeal this. Yeah, before, nine, before 2016. And so I'm, I'm wondering if the Republicans, you and the Republicans get back in power, is that again going to come up to be repealed? And if you do, what what is the Republican plan to provide affordable health care yeah. for my children? God, that question is a blast from the past. Yeah, like, <laughs> right. I forgot that was even a thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They never came up with actually what their different uh, plan would be. But anyway, sorry. The Republican plan to provide affordable health care yeah. for my children. It's not repealing the Affordable Care Act, if that's your question. So are you saying that you yes, will I'm not? Yes, I'm saying I would not, we're not going to repeal the Affordable Care Act. You and all Republicans. Well, I can all, I, there's, there's 49 million. <laughs> okay, so you're speaking for yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is, do we trust him there? Oh no, I, I, I think absolutely not. Um 
if they had like you know if they if they take the senate and if they, if they were in ever in like i mean the tough thing is they didn't do it when they had the chance but yeah i i, I think like they'll nip away at it and say they're not we're yes. just trying to strengthen it um but which they've but, already done yeah. through the supreme court or they have attempted to do so exactly you know? and so. like now i think the only interesting thing is that it's become a political liability to say that and i hope that this is the case for all other republicans i mean who knows if they're they're going to still be like well, no we want to be the um cutting healthcare party because it like i do feel like the santas and stuff there's a new type of populist attempt with the censorship stuff um but it, where they try to like not be like like rick, rick scott screwing it up for them by saying how much he wants to raise taxes on everyday people right like there are certain republicans that are annoyed with that so i don't know i'm just interested in how and grassley i think makes sense as someone who is more sensitive i mean look at the makeup of that uh, a lot of older folks group um i mean not that they i guess cared so much about obamacare particularly right but, yeah i mean it, it, the, they'll care about something like <laughs> medicare um but i but i guess that's also just kind of the demographic that comes to town halls to a degree yeah um older people tend to do so but um you know Part of me believes that they are not going to make this a uh, priority <clears throat> for some of the one. I mean, never underestimate the Republicans to be as vicious as possible. But like some uh, of the the you know the private um, the, the 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 private companies that benefited from the Affordable Care Act. There might be some pushback on that. They've expanded the scope of their customer base. Um, it's allowed for more money to flow to these private companies. Yeah. It was a pro-capitalist health reform. Yeah, it was Mitt Romney's, as we've heard and we've probably said to you many, many times. There are more people who have private insurance due to uh, uh, the Obamacare um, plan and the way that the costs were lowered, but it's still way too high. Um, and, and more customers for them, even if, uh, the, they're not able to gouge them to the same degree that they would have been able to before the ACA passed. So I, I think that there's a lot of trepidation on behalf of the, of the Republicans to address this and repeal it altogether. Um, so that I, I think Matt, you're right that they would chip away at it, but this is, this is why, when you're passing landmark legislation, you go as far as you possibly can. You go as far as you possibly can. Because as soon as those programs are a little bit entrenched, and even a crappy program like the ACA that has a lot of, you know, issues and is way too costly still, you, you hear that constituent there saying, I, I, my kids are on, on the ACA. I, th th it right. would affect me materially one of the great provisions of the aca and um i mean it, it could just be uh you can keep your kids on for as long as you're both alive um uh but right um so point being the aca obviously did not go far enough but even the fact that it did give coverage to millions it shows that progressive push pushing of progressive legislation and entrenching that kind of stuff it makes a huge difference because that's why you hear uproars about getting rid of Medicare, Medicaid, chipping away at Social Security, because those programs are in the public consciousness at a certain point, and it makes it a lot harder to get rid of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, imagine if we passed universal health care uh, free at the point of service and the Supreme Court took it away. Riots in the streets. I mean, it'd be, it would be I, I hope so. <laughs> And it would be at least informative as to like the problem of our Supreme Court. Like that's the thing is like this, there's a certain Dem tendency that's going to be really annoying in the next few decades where it's like, well, we can't do that because the Supreme Court do it and let the Supreme Court take that heat. That's it was always the problem with all of this stuff. Like, well, Christian cinema, we can't do this because what if the Republicans get in power and undo it? Yeah. It's like, well, that would be a political price that they have to pay. And it's one that Democrats, they never like to do stuff. Like, look how long it's taken to get rid of Title 42. Can I give an update? Yeah. Or something? Um, Stephen in, Stephen in uh, Pittsburgh, who uh, called in earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about that, blue, that Starbucks in Pittsburgh. Uh, the Bloomfield Starbucks, first union Starbucks in Pennsylvania, unanimous vote of 20 to zero. 
unanimous vote. Ooh, we, there had been a lot of like 17 to 1 and 12 to 1. So unanimous is. Look at that. Pittsburgh, I mean, the, the, that community there, you, you talk about how like, was it you, Matt, who was saying how, who was the person we were speaking with that like their parents were in a union and like it gave you some literacy in that? Was that you? No, somebody else. Ooh, uh, I know what you're talking. I remember that though. Yeah, but yeah, like you, you literally like the there's no institutional memory. There. Right, right. But but in Pittsburgh, there's that there's an there's a bit of an institutional oh, memory. Yeah. <laughs> so look at that. That's really exciting. There's a lot going on in Pennsylvania right now, electorally. From a labor perspective, pay attention. Pennsylvania has a lot of stuff on the ground, you know, whether it's Featherman's campaign, whether it's Summerlee's campaign, whether it's Hunt's campaign in Philly, there are a lot of great candidates and also great organizing that's happening in in uh, Pennsylvania right now. Yeah. So. Also, go to a unionizing Starbucks and tell them you support them uh, because socialism here in America. So we're headed. Yes. And to your point, Emma, um, uh, Emily's list poll has Summer Lee up in her primary by 25 points. All right. I don't want to get my hopes up. When do we have that uh, Pennsylvania primary? Support Summer Lee. Support John Featherman. Support uh, Hunt. May 17th. Alexandra Hunt. May 17th. All right. So we've got about a month. About a month. I think we should do a stream on that night. That's uh, that's my that's my thought. I said that to Sam, and you know, he, I think he'll get back to me once he's not feeling so crappy. Uh, <laughs> J Man raps. <clears throat> hey, ho hope Sam is feeling better soon. My mom is triple vax and got COVID two days ago. She's doing okay, but COVID ain't over, folks. So yeah, my my friend just got it. It's 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 definitely on the on the rise here in New York. Um, Omega's Shenron Dragon. Hi, MR crew. Before anything, my name is Omega Shenron Dragon, but I get why y'all would mispronounce it. It is infuriating that over three, uh, 30, sorry, 3,000 cops, get it, or 3K cops, are in the subway system. No cameras. Um, I don't get what 3K cops means. A uh, KKK. Oh. Um, are in the subway system. No cameras are in necessary parts of stations and occurrences like robberies and incredibly violent crimes happen even now. We need to defund police, but we need to punctuate, uh, punctuate the slogan re to reinvest in our communities and kick out violent cops in order to reform. Mopping up. Update on MR's favorite grifter. Jimmy Dore and Kim Iverson yesterday attended and spoke at the meeting of Teachers for Choice, an anti-union and anti-vax group in L.A. in case you want to know about his current stance on vaccines and teachers unions. Yeah, I maybe. saw that. Yeah, we did see that. I also did see a clip of his stand up. We might play that tomorrow, maybe at the anti vax rally. Yeah, it's not good, folks. It's not so, good. yeah, leave the AFT. They're a bunch of sellouts, they're just fear mongering you. I five. Remember, DeSantis had an ad where he read from Trump's book to his child. Oh, I forgot that was so pathetic. He shouldn't be talking about parental responsibility. It's really crazy what women can do. Cause like I You forgot about that? As a candidate, he yeah. just seems such a like a lamo. And now he's one and he's the daddy of conservative uh, right wing media. Dave from Jamaica. There has been some knee jerk reactions due to the increase in crime even coming from some left figures. While I don't have the answers outside of uh, very long term ones, which take a while to see results, we should not be making the same making the mistake and just react. That type of thinking led to the crime bill. A hundred percent. And there's already um Democrats are already trying to take some sort of uh new tough on crime approach in terms of proposals that they're um introducing in in the Senate, I believe. Politico writes if 2020 was the year that the left reordered the traditional politics of crime and policing, 2022 looks like the year centrists regained their footing and nullified those gains. President Joe Biden is proclaiming that it's time to, quote, fund the police and pouring more money into law enforcement in his budget plan. Democratic mayors in deep blue cities are promising to hire hundreds more cops. Even in liberal bastions like Los Angeles, candidates are sprinting to claim the tough on crime uh, mantle. 
So I guess I'm sorry I misspoke earlier. This is in his budget less in terms of like formal legislation in the Senate, but you um, you have senators like uh, Masto out of Nevada talking about supporting the police. You have Maggie Hassan, right? Or it was Maggie Hassan, or was it Patty Murray? Where where? Um, Maggie, Maggie Hassan went to the border. Yeah. Yeah. Oh right, right. Okay, so that's yeah. pro. That was bizarre. Yeah. That's different. Yeah. Um, but but. But still, like there, there's a bit of blowback in terms of like a perception they're not tough on immigration, not tough on crime, and they're overcompensating. Let's take another call. Calling from a nine five one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello. 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 Uh, this is Hannah from Southern California. Hannah from Southern California. What's on your mind? Um, I wanted to talk about the Don't Say Gay Bill and critical race theory was kind of just an anecdote. And hopefully you guys can add to it. Sure. Um, I know like it doesn't literally say don't say gay. And I know critical race theory like literally isn't being taught. But like when I was in middle school and like even through high school, like kids were calling each other gay all the time. Kids were using gay slurs. Kids were, you know, making horrible, you know, racist jokes. And I don't make like, and I said the same thing too. I just didn't know. And I'm not trying to make myself the victim in any way. Um, however, I really do wish we would have had some like queer history more mm. race-based history to like understand what we were doing was wrong you know yeah um and i we just never got that and yeah i mean i think that's super important just on like the basic level of like not calling other kids gay and using slurs and making jokes like that's messed up too at like the very like lowest level of things besides like you know trans kids commit committing suicide but like I never I didn't know about anything like that when I was in middle school and even through high school and that contributes to like the society of like homophobia and transphobia and um yeah I just wanted to see if you guys had um anything to add to that look Thank I mean you. yeah I I had some I, I went to an all-girls school so we were constantly overcompensating for being called uh like gay all the time and I feel like I feel mm -hmm. I and I feel similarly in terms of like I think my school was better than some others in terms of learning you know anti-racist history but I really think there's a lack of uh queer history being taught throughout the country um maybe that changes but that is a, a a really scary uh, offshoot of of the don't say gay bill stuff too. It's gonna be much like the anti CRT bills, um, a chilling effect on any history taught about those groups that's like divergent from conservative thinking. That the, they're trying mm -hmm. to to halt that altogether. Um, and so when you talk about indoctrination, uh, you think high schools are going to be teaching Stonewall right now or about the reality no. of the AIDS crisis. Um, I mean, right. that, that's, that's a huge issue. Yeah, and it was, you know, like, I'm, again, not trying to make myself a victim here because I was definitely not at all, but it was never meant to hurt anyone, you know? It was just like we didn't know. And, you know, we thought it, they were funny jokes. And I thought we were kind of moving away from that as far as, like, the, you know, middle school kids and high school kids throughout the past few years. But it just looks like that is going to be coming back in full force. Yeah, Which I mean, is, like, the simplest thing someone yeah. can do. The, it is a, it's a really widespread problem. Um, it, in North Dakota, the issue that I think like was really failed by public education in a way that like, to my shame, I remember having a sort of like, I'd say racist reaction to, are we going to do more native American stuff? This is like a seventh grade. Are we really need to do another, like, like a native American segment about their culture and stuff like that. 
And the problem, and, and that's horrible. And like, there's a, a political interest in, in sort of trapping people in that sort of reaction and then cultivating it into more racism. And the problem is, is because we're not able to get sort of, like you said, like real history. Like we, we don't understand the world that we've inherited and the place that we've been put into it. And so at even to this day, uh, the idea that like we've gone over woke or whatever on these issues is just ludicrous, yeah. right? Like the uh, official like position, having any curriculum based on um, like the um, Great Sioux Nation or um, Ocheri Shakowin uh, in uh, uh, the Sioux people, uh, for folks who don't know, um, and the way that they were removed from Minnesota, like that doesn't just call it a genocide. Like we can't we can't be forthright with terms like that. You you can't like we're we're still in denial about oh actually there's violence on all sides and uh, ho hum isn't it bad that it happened but we're all over it now aren't we and like that's sort of that's a that's a, always a challenge with public education because fundamentally like you're dealing with people who want uh are against busing your kids into their school and stuff like that and you have to you have to compromise with them and uh and often they don't want to compromise back and where this is a period now where they're getting bold to say no we want school to be a place for cultivating bigotry right exactly i just think that it's such a basic thing to do that would just help so much and these don't say gay crt trans bills just make it so much worse on like such a small scale of things like kids not calling each other gay anymore would be great (laughs) well so anyway, thanks. Uh, Hannah, I really appreciate your insights and, you know, your honesty, too, about some of the ways you've evolved as well. We all have. Um, and uh, it, it's just or not. Maybe we all have. But I think a lot of everybody right. listening to the show has evolved from a, a certain position. So um, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Speaking of that kind of legislation, let's do seven, this anti-trans um, bill. So. In addition to Don't Say Gay and the other copycat bills that are coming uh, across governor's desks throughout the country, which is a way to not just target gay, uh, trans people, but target gay people. Um, but it's also a way to kind of grease the runways for the more uh, anti-trans bathroom bills. That's going to that's circulating throughout the country. Well, a resurgence of uh, of those um, as opposed to these broad bans of trans athletes in order to continue to other them in certain uh, high school sports, because conservatives now care so much about the integrity of high school swim meets for girls. That's the number one galvanizing force. Do we uh, have any instances in our communities of of uh, trans athletes having an unfair competitive advantage and beating our girls. And so they get the silver medal as opposed to the gold. Uh, No, not necessarily, but we're still going to pass this anyway. I mean, in Utah, the Republican governor, to his credit, vetoed the legislation when it first came about. And I think it might have overridden his veto anyway. Bradley, do you mind checking on that? Um, Not not, not exactly sure uh, off the top of my head. But the reason that he vetoed it was because he said there are four trans athletes in the country and only in in my state right now competing, and only one trans girl uh, participating in sports. So that's one person for this legislation to target them. One child. The legislature overrode his veto in late March. But yeah, like you said, like his statement was literally like, I just want these kids to be alive. Like, right. I don't, you know, there's four of them. Also, know? a note on that. I think the NBA uh, has changed this, but initially they moved the um, All-Star game, I think from North Carolina or maybe it was Georgia, or, uh, somewhere where there was one of these bills. Uh, maybe it was Florida. I'm not sure. North Carolina, the initial bathroom bill from years ago? No, no, recently. And they moved it to Utah. And then Utah did this as well. And I think that Utah is going to lose the All-Star game as well, which is uh, as it should be. So anyway, um, Tennessee is, despite like that very uh, well said, I think, veto and, and the case that the, the Utah governor laid out, Tennessee is still going forward with this legislation. And here uh, are two Tennessee state senators interacting where 
the simple question is asked, do you even know how many trans athletes there are in Tennessee? Who are you targeting with this? Here's this interaction. I'm curious if the sponsor had like has relationships or has spoken to anyone in uh, like who is transgender about this legislation and and tried to actually understand what the, their thoughts are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And no, I have not, but certainly had this bill in the committee and and heard testimony. But the whole purpose of the bill, again, is to create that level playing field so that we don't discriminate against anyone. How many transgender athletes are competing in women's sports in Tennessee at the middle, high, or collegiate level? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know of any in Tennessee, but we've certainly all seen them competing in other states. Leah Thomas, the swimmer that won the 500-meter free, free, freestyle, I believe, was what yeah, she Yeah, really won. cares about that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know of a personal example in Tennessee. <laughs> but we don't want it to happen in Tennessee. Just like the Olympic Committee, just like the TWS delay, they have a lot of issues that they're working through as this uh, concerning the participation of transgender youth and young people in sports. But there's a way to do that in an individualized way that makes sure that you are guaranteeing safety to make sure that you're protecting the integrity of competition. But like, that's not what we're doing here. We're just drawing a bright line rule saying no. Well, this is stupid too, but anyway. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't love that, that the uh, rebuttal there from that Democrat, but he is a Democrat in Tennessee, so he's doing the best he can. Um, yeah, the, couldn't come up with an example, didn't speak to a trans person, had to come up with the one hot button example of Leah Thomas uh, in, in that swim meet that happened weeks ago, which, you know, Trump is still hosting rallies about. Like, th this is bigotry. They're, they're sing singling out individual cases to make broad legislation that targets trans kids and continues to other them. Stay in the closet. And if you don't stay in the closet... Here's codified legislation that shows that you're wrong and you're other and the state has passed it and your classmates have the right to bully you and mock you and drive you to a mental health crisis. And we sanction that as state lawmakers. That's what this is. And it's going to be extremely invasive as they try to um, enforce it, because if you he mentioned the Olympics there, <clears throat> the Olympics have this like testosterone sort of testing regimen, which seems extremely like convoluted and complicated and like problematic, frankly. Yes. And so this whole thing with Marsha Blackburn and talk, asking uh, Katanji Brown Jackson, what the definition of a woman is well it's actually pretty difficult it turns out when you have to uh, define that and it comes into what does these guys want do they want to inspect the genitals of uh any sort of high school athlete to make sure that they're on the right uh side of things are we going to do testosterone testing for kids now like what what exactly because it's it, it is they want it to be as because it's ultimately uh an appeal to fundamentalism uh, they want it to be really simple, but it's going to be really invasive and disgusting. And they act like testosterone is our steroids. I mean, that's one of the, what, six gender indicators that you uh, you spoke about a few yeah. weeks ago. And it's just, it's like, there's, testosterone is not uh, like, you know, whatever uh, the Hulk <laughs> takes to turn into... <laughs> To himself or what how it's what, not in uh, whatever chemical uh, imbalance is created in terms of like to to get him to turn into the hulk so i mean it's just it, it's it's ridiculous and it's dangerous frosted tipo tip o'neill uh the <laughs> The CPC has endorsed Chantel Brown over Nina Turner. Apparently, Brown joined the CPC in January. What a joke. Yeah. Yeah, we need to do more smoke on Chantel Brown, who uh, was elected supposedly to get Joe Biden's back somehow, whatever that means, and is now currently uh, paying off um, the money that she got from the Democratic majority for Israel uh, by trying to concern troll the Iran deal out of place. Uh, so uh, Chantel Brown and the Democratic majority for Israel, um, both of these things are problems that need addressing and uh, and con continued scrutiny. Yeah. And it's just it's um, 
look, they're going to endorse their incumbents, right? I think it's wrong. But this is why the CPC needs higher standards. That's my, like, number one. A smaller club. Much smaller club. Yep. Dave from Jamaica, these anti-trans madness piss, it pisses me so off, uh, off so much. Um, <laughs> not only does un- it unfairly affect trans people, it also affects women of color. Christine um, Moba got banned from the 400 meter due to high natural testosterone levels. Yeah, yeah it's insane. Punch drunk pulpit. Call me a bigot if you want, but I just can't support giving children lethal doses of gamma radiation. That's what I was trying to think of. My new name. Charlie Kirk asserts that tall buildings make people liberal. The higher the building, the more liberal the voter. It just is. The closer to the ground you are, the more conservative you are. Genius. Yeah. Yeah. The news for um, Saudi Arabia, <laughs> Dubai. Glass Eagle. Great call on CRT. More people should move from saying it's not taught to defending it on its merits. Not my favorite dude, but people who the judge has done that effectively with infrastructure history. Yes. No, it has. You have to make the counter claim, counter accusation, which is that these people want to enforce mythology onto kids. Like that's the problem that they have with CRT is it attacks their mythology. John in Omaha, there should be a sound drop of solidarity forever when you break good union news. It's a good idea. Rob. It is very, very disturbing when I hear the millionaire or billionaire word, and I've told them to stop it, knock it off. Knock it off. Who is that? That's a Klubeck, who was a, uh, I forgot his first name, actually, it's been a while, but he's the guy who went on MSNBC and said Bernie was being Yeah, bad. I remember that. Stephen Klubeck, American businessman and substantial donor to the Democratic Party, is founder and chairman of executive officer of timeshare company diamond resorts that's right teacher dan why do men have nipples if it's them ladies that use the boobies for feeding those babies what is a real man even should they get my nipples removed yeah you can't well whatever you do don't compete in sports if you have nipples it's illegal mark the shark whatever emma emma those unionized starbucks workers would probably punch you in the face (laughs) (laughs) it's a good point Let's do this Greg Kelly clip. So Greg Kelly is not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, as people who have been watching this program know, I have the real a real long... train boy, Greg I, Kelly. Yeah, <laughs> right. We know he loves his model trains, um, which he equates to gender identity and sexuality. Maybe yeah. he might want to examine uh, what he feels when he touches a train model train that is regardless um he here he is uh kind of challenging my commitment to the war on the term smart as it being a social construct because he's pretty stupid um there are a few few uh exemptions to uh to my rule and he is one of them speaking about Katanji Brown Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court, and he seems to miss like the obvious answer to his own point that he's making here. I took that statement to mean that somehow there was active discrimination taking place against people like her because of the way she looked. That white men were specifically discriminating against black women because of their black skin and their gender. I don't believe that. Now, during major parts of our history, women couldn't vote, women couldn't do a lot of things, and we had a horrible phase with slavery like so many other countries in the world. Just a but phase. for a long chunk of- Even there, like so many countries in the world, the, the, the minimizing it, everybody was doing it. The triangle slave trade would not have been, like, like, and, like the global slave trade that uh, occurred is much different than like what you hear in the bible yes <laughs> for instance right like the, and it's because of uh frankly the uh the um advances of capitalism it was the underpinning it to be so massively brutal yeah it was the underpinning of like colonialism and capitalism as we know it, it now um and the united states and like great britain and other countries like that were the main beneficiaries so it's not a lot of countries it's actually a handful of them and we were we were one of them but continue 
phase with slavery like so many other countries in the world. But for a long chunk of time, there were not enough eligible black women to be considered for the Supreme Court. You can look it up. The numbers have been very, very small. The way she portrays it, it was active discrimination based on race and gender. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. Harvard had their very first graduate in 1956 from the law school, a black woman, Yale 1931. You know, all these justices seem to come from the same school. They just did not have a significant pool of people to choose from. Is that fair? So why is that? Why did they not have a significant pool of people to choose from? So the first uh, <laughs> uh, black woman to graduate from Harvard Law School is a woman named Lila Fenwick, who had a pretty in interesting life. She has an interesting Wikipedia you might want to yeah. check out. Um, she was a lawyer, human rights advocate, and a UN, UN official, United Nations. Um, it was only three years in 1953 that that was even open to her as an option, uh, particularly or, or specifically for those issues of her gender and race. Hmm. Yeah, the the small pool of those candidates that he puts up there on the graphic might have something to do with the discrimination that he is saying didn't exist hmm. or doesn't exist now. Perhaps like the small pool takes a little while to get people funneled through those systems. Particularly when uh, certain things like, I mean, just to name one thing, uh, one structural advantage, uh, legacy admissions. So like, uh, it's hard to have a leg, get in as a legacy. if He'd know nothing uh, about legacy. Everyone from your race uh, was bar and uh, gender was barred. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, Greg Kelly, whose uh, father was uh, the... New York City Police Chief Ray Kelly, he'd know nothing about, know nothing about getting to a certain place because of one's. Uh, I didn't know that that's Greg Kelly's background, but that makes sense because Kelly's interesting in that he doesn't seem to be particularly serious uh, about any of this stuff. Like he, he seems more cynical, but he also is like a rancid, horrible person. Um, so it makes sense that he's just some cop kid. We have some breaking news via Bradley. Frank James has been taken into police custody. Okay. Credit to uh, M. Toussaint in the chat for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, New York Post is reporting. The madman who, okay, opened fire on a Brooklyn subway car and left 29 injured. 10 of them shot has been taken into custody. Law enforcement sources tell the Post. So I guess they the confirmed Post. that yeah. he was just... um, I guess that they still still alleged uh, but not shocking to me that the post has law enforcement sources on speed dial <laughs> um this cout of water fish out of water gotcha is there how to start a labor union for dummies type of thing going out there? I don't know, but I mean, check out more perfect union. They've been doing great work on this. Um, yeah, there was a good, um, Bernie did, uh, was it Bernie, uh, Chris Smalls, uh, uh, did a live stream for Jacobin. I think, I think I'm getting those details, right. Um, that may have gone into something like that too. I did see something floating around, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. De Cuomo Bravas. There's literally no qualifi qualification standard to sit on the Supreme Court. You don't need to be a lawyer. You don't need to have a college degree. You don't need to have been elected or have been a judge previously. The only thing you need to do uh, need is to, ser to serve is to be nominated by the president. That's it. Bernie is my dog, 33. Check out the latest episode of Atlanta if you want to see how you can vicariously start to one millionth understand slavery and how it affects very artful and effective. I've never seen Atlanta, but uh, it looks good. I've heard good things, yeah. Mark Monkey. Hey, guys, not sure if I uh, miss as much as I've been taking care of my son, but have you looked into my family's health fundraiser? Appreciate you guys. And no, things got busy, oh, so yeah. I figured I'd reach out. Oh, um, yeah, actually, I, I told him to um, email in, and then Sam's been gone. <laughs> um, but we'll, yeah, Mark. We'll flag it here. Yeah, yeah. Mark Monkey. And Bradley's on it right now. Sending it. 
All right, we'll pull that up. Rory Gato says, Secrets of a Successful Organizer. I think that's the name of the stream, right? So you guys can check that out. And here is um, here's the GoFundMe. Yeah, so uh, does it have uh, doesn't have a short URL, but Mark uh, Lois Sell is organizing this fundraiser. That's L O I S E L L E. Uh, oh, Ben Burgess. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna donate uh, after the show today, and I'll put it in YouTube notes and uh, show notes, so yeah, we'll have it in there. Um, yeah, horrible. Yeah. All right. I'm. Uh, the surfs also tweeted out the the link, I think. So, wait, no, this is a different fundraiser. I apologize. I'll, I'll find it in the show notes and and I'll donate myself after the show. Mark Monkey, thanks for reminding us, by the way. Um. All right, let's take one more call. This will be the final call of the day. Calling from a nine one seven number. Who's this? Where are you calling from? This is Alex from New York. Alex from New York. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit about um, what the our previous caller said about, like, you know, being younger and using uh, homophobic slurs and stuff. I went to, like, private schools in New York. Mm -hmm. so, the curriculum that we had is the curriculum that they're terrified of. Yes. Now. Probably similar uh, to my curriculum, yes, in high school. Yeah, and probably because these people, like you said, Fox News headquarters is in Manhattan, and they send their kids to private schools, and they're worried. You know, I think all of this is just they don't want their kids going to school and then coming home and disagreeing with their philosophies. Yes. Yeah. Or going off to college and coming back for Thanksgiving being like, what have you been saying this whole time? This is all wrong. And that's where all this stress comes from. But I've heard, like, you know, who knows if they're conservative or not, but there have been some, like, black parents at these school board meetings. And their concerns are stuff that resonated with me as a mixed race person who went, who was in these classes. One woman was talking about, I don't want my kid to, to be told that they're a victim and feel, you know, less than other kids. I don't know who they are or, you know, their background, but I remember being, you know, talking about slavery in school as a little kid and being like the only part black person there and it being kind of awkward and it feeling weird. And, you know, the other white kids like sort of after that class, like deferring to me or like apologizing. Yeah. And like, I get to white parents who don't want their kids to feel guilty for slavery. I, you know, I, I felt weird and on the spot. And I can see if some kid went home and told their parents that and the parents don't have a good response that they would blame the school and get mad at the teachers and stuff. So I kind of get where some of this is coming from on like a, you know, a familial level, a, parent, a, a personal level. But the way that they're using it and taking this and like running with it is, you know, obviously totally screwed up. Yeah, I mean, I think that dynamic is exactly why that they're so keen to use it because they do get a lot of people who are that that feel that sort of thing. Like, I don't want, and and they can pull quotes from like Robin DiAngelo where it is mm. like sort of race essentialist and unhelpful, right? And that's that stuff does suck. Yeah, that sort of corporate anti-racism stuff that is like uh, that that everybody feel no matter if you're a white person or a non-white person, you feel condescended to by that sort of like you know, dumb corporate anti-racism. And I, I think that's, that is a big part of why Republicans feel it's such a winning issue for them. Um, and I, I think that like the key is like, it's a, it's, a, it's that discomfort is unavoidable from the nature of public education. And it's something that we need to frankly defend. And we just have to have better uh, um, um, uh, sort of environments to teach people about these things and, and an ability to be honest about them in a way that doesn't, like you say, like shame people individually for yes. uh, the sort of historical inheritance that we've been given. Yeah, that's the that's the I, I, that is the the tension that like conservatives are capitalizing on is when, you know, I don't know, Alex, if we had a similar experience, but like 
a lot of lot of white liberals uh, i feel like mm-hmm. focusing on and centering white people in these conversations about how you can individually be less racist that's robin d'angelo's entire thing it's how can i make this conversation oh. about racism actually about white people and then you know when someone's talking to you as a mixed race person right like they're centering mm-hmm. themselves and putting the emotional burden on you uh, with these questions. So the the point is, is that you got to divert and, and make it about a systemic and intersectional critique about history. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I'll, some of the kids I went to school with are now, you know, philanthropists, entrepreneurs trying to, you know, going over to Africa, doing the, the Sean Penn thing, mm-hmm. they go to Africa. And they pretend that they're helping while really they're making money for a nonprofit or whatever the hell. Uh, so, yeah, they had the exact intended effect where they feel good and that they're doing something. But really, hey, you're rich. Just just use your money correctly and, and try not to just make more of it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, that's a big problem with like liberals in this, particularly like liberal pro uh, capitalist liberals that they I sort of they invoke all this stuff this horrible history and their solution to that is that we should all sort of like feel bad about it in the present as opposed to say uh get dismantle the structures that uh we inherited from that and uh and also like get rid of the exploitation that it has sort of continued even despite the uh riddance of slavery uh of particularly of people especially based on a sort of like racial caste system uh, and the way to do that is to liberate workers in general and like i i think that is that that is the problem um is that you have the the liberal response is particularly um it, it's it's not one it's not a real response i mean and the, the you know they can't do that because at the end of the day they're private schools and they need money yeah right, or they want money and they you know these rich famous actors aren't going to send their kids there <laughs> uh but anyways, all right, Alex. I called. Oh, here's your matchup. Yeah, get to, day. get down to brass tax. Tax, come on. Brass tax. Yeah. Dick Cheney versus <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, and Liz Cheney versus Chelsea Clinton. Okay, hold on. Cheney shot somebody, so I'm probably might take Cheney. Oh uh, wait, that's he doesn't not... have a gun in this fight. Oh right, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, I I think I'm taking Murdoch. Murdoch is like. I know, I saw he Rupert, might be more resourceful. I saw Rupert Murdoch get pied, and it did not look. Uh, it looked sort of. He looked very <laughs> enfeebled. Uh, so I think I think I'm going with Cheney's on both. He of them. also is ten years younger, uh, Cheney, than Murdoch. Oh, then I'm taking Cheney. Yeah, Rupert is old as hell. Um. All right. So, uh, and also, I I feel like didn't wasn't Dick Cheney some sort of athlete in high school or something like that? He's got that Wyoming. Is it, I don't know if he's from Wyoming, but yeah. yeah. Um. But and uh, Liz Cheney versus who? Chelsea Clinton. Yeah, I'm not taking Chelsea in a fight. Liz. That's Liz all day. Liz. Yeah, yeah it's got to be Liz. <laughs> all right, guys. I'll, t- I'll call back later. All right. Bye, okay, Alex. Thank day. you. Stay safe out there. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Dur Devil. Hey, Emma, you're doing an excellent job this week. The conspiracy to take over the majority report is going to plan. I've read all about Eminon online, and I know how the MR crew engineered COVID to subtweet subvert sorry the deep sam's state where we all go we already were there because we went there which is now here yes catchy (laughs) prairie far kowalski when it comes to trans girls high school sports i think the gop politicians just don't want to accidentally be scoping out underage trans people when that's sports games yeah i also think that you know trans uh Trans girls make men who are insecure about like pa- patriarchy being threatened and their own masculinity question some things that they've never had to question before, and that makes them anxious. Congressional baseball fan, it's a challenging time for many of us. Things are pretty bleak. May you all have the confidence and enthusiasm of, ri- of a rich person's adult son. <laughs> it's more important than ever to keep. Uh, to always keep in mind that you can do whatever you want to in life. Just make sure you do it well and you do it with passion. Thank you. Why Coke's still out there? 
<laughs> Jay Tingle, Chaney was not an athlete. He washed out of Yale because he spent all of his time drinking with the football team. Also, he's on his second heart. Yeah. M- maybe Murdoch. Hmm. Leech. We also need less leftists like Kyle Kolinsky who believe that I get a pass on homophobic language just because they are allies. He wondered on the Drunken Peasant podcast why he, why he can't call his friends the F word anymore. The slur. That yeah. would seem like an ill-advised conversation. Yep. That's maybe one you don't want to have in front of a microphone. I, also, Drunken Peasant, that can't be the dissident peasant that we know. Must be a different podcast. Must be. Uh, is this me? What do you think of the Derek Carr extension? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think he's he gets too much hate uh, in terms of his play. Like, I think he really can do a lot of things. Like, I'd take him over Kirk Cousins. Um, I'd take him right now over Matt Ryan. I would take him... I think he's, you know, a top 12 quarterback. Yeah, he's 31 and Ryan's 37. Yeah. And I think, I'm, I'm not saying Ryan doesn't have has some years. He definitely has some years left. But, Carr, I, I think when you want to have a, when you want to have a, good to great quarterback you'd rather have i'd rather have Derek carr than like be in the falcons position at like marcus mariota's like a top cap you know he's he's good enough to be competitive in that in the stacked AFC. yeah and i it's mcdaniels wants to run a new england style offense he'll be good at that um he's precise especially in intermediate routes and uh he, he can throw a pretty like fade in the end zone and things like that so that'll be good for them and and um you know I, I don't think Gruden is an effective offensive coordinator to the same degree that McDaniels is, but it is comp it's complicated like New England, just less less effective despite being complicated. So he'll he'll be used to, you know, having to to be the robot for the offense to that degree. So long long story short, I like it for the most part. Um and he's got weapons. And he, and you know, yeah, they've got to go all pro. in. They've got to go all in, right. Um with with this and, and see if this can actually work even though I find him to be a very lame person. Him and Russell Wilson are the mo- biggest losers to play quarterback. Um, such lame people. Anyway, H-Dub, this, that means Cheney is a brand new heart. He'd win for sure. <laughs> I don't know if that's how that works. All right, let's do another clip, final clip. Then we'll read some, some IMs and then we'll get out of here. Any, uh, any thoughts, you guys? Jesse Waters. Well, the Charlie Kirk clip is just wildly racist, so I don't know if we want to get into that, or we could just do another KBJ clip. That's what Cruz is talking about. Let's do Charlie about. Kirk. Okay. Let's do yeah, Charlie it's Kirk. just it's just like it's astonishing. That's yeah. Only reason I'd even bring it up. Charlie Kirk. Um... Talk, was just i guess generally talking about mosques uh in minneapolis so, because they've been calling worshipers to prayer yeah apparently they're now allowing it to be more of a of, a, of like a um there's a new city ordinance or something like that where where mosques can actually you know issue a call to prayer wow so uh in addition to church bells there will also be mosques calling muslims to prayer i mean we can't stand for this. We must silence them. But anyway, uh, oh, also, here's a segment on censorship and how it's bad. Here he is uh, weighing in on this just pressing, pressing issue in Minneapolis, which, you know, coincidentally has a decently sized Muslim population. So this makes sense. But, uh, of course, it's just like uh, an Islam, Islamic takeover of the United States. <sighs> 20 percent of all Americans. You take a Randall sampling size at a sports game, or in a city, and one out of five will be here illegally. Now, what is the reason for that? Part of it is because of political power. Part of it is because they want to try to have demographics that fit their narrative. No, pause that it. Fit their- Part of that is because uh, we have draconian and nonsensical immigration laws that don't allow people to come to this country in a way that, like— uh, makes sense given the realities on the ground and we commit to a punitive approach that helps nobody political outcomes they brag about it we're not allowed to say this out loud when we say it out loud we get called all these terrible names that we're engaging in 
-hmm. replacement theory. I don't even know what that is. Just go and Connor, pull up the clip of Castro saying it. Pull up the clip of the Democrat operative saying it. Can you pause they it say too? that just I'm a sorry. matter. Of um, I know I'm pausing a bunch with this, but like when they Tucker does this all the time too with great replacement or with white supremacy. What even is that? I don't even know what that is. That they know exactly what they're doing when they say that. They don't denounce it. They claim ignorance despite working in politics and political media. Yeah. Because like the the white supremacy, they've been trained for years to look for signals with conservative thinkers and media personalities and um and politicians for to 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 show like a, a sly wink and a nod of sympathy to white supremacy and that's what charlie kirk did just yeah did. it's it's uh suspend your the judgment that you think is probably appropriate for this sort of discussion and uh, allow me to uh tr persuade you towards white nationalism they say that just a matter of time because of the open southern border, Texas will become a blue state and the country will be permanently transformed. But it's beyond that. They're not just trying to transform the politics. They're trying to change the type of thing that we are. Change or replace the type of thing. Right? They want you to get used to living amongst foreigners. Now, immigrants can be a wonderful benefit to a society. But? But when it's too much, too much, <laughs> now is too much. When you have in Minneapolis, the city council now allowing the call to prayer to be issued four times a day in Minneapolis, you got to ask yourself the question and say, was that in the vision of the founding fathers to try to stay consistent with self-government and liberty and values and virtue? I'm all for religious expression and freedom, but is that consistent with the values of Minnesota to make it Mogadishu? I don't think so. Make it Mogadishu. So God. when you have unrestrained Hilarious. immigration – both legal and illegal, the thing that we are starts to change. Change or get replaced by those immigrants, right? Welcome to Candace. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. So that like that's another so when he said the vision of the founding fathers, um this is why invoking the founding fathers as a rhetorical device is not a useful exercise. Because mythologizing them, it only it serves reactionary right wingers who already want us to like return to a certain vision of society. And then you know if you have like an amorphous uh, vision of what found the founding fathers wanted, it's going to trend towards whiteness, and it's going to trend towards like the the colonists and the col the capitalists that founded this country, right? Like that would be their vision, and so. Right wingers use that to extrapolate and exclude certain people from our society. I mean, yeah, that was just like, it was just a little too obvious, Charlie, dude. Like, if you're going to pretend and plead ignorance on great replacement and then proceed to go on a racist rant about Muslims in this country, you might just want to take you know, a few seconds in between those things to to sell that you just, you have, you have no idea what you're talking about when you hear great replacement. Yeah, I mean, it also um, it mythologizes them in a way that um, even gives them less credit than they could be getting. Like Thomas Jefferson, who I'm not a fan of for a lot of reasons we've discussed even recently on this uh, show. But uh, with regards to like religious freedom, like he owned the Quran and the letter to the mm -hmm. Danbury Baptist yeah. was all about how we need to like protect religious freedom. Um, and so I think that I don't know how he would have felt about um a call to prayer that, that's not really in my <laughs> that's a, a kind of mildly humorous um thought experiment not something i would base uh uh whether to allow people to have religious rights on um but like what is what is religious expression if it's not like ringing church bells or a call to prayer like that um and uh and and i also just want to say this is why I, unlike some people on the left, don't dismiss the amount of like sort of far right white supremacist uh, sort of stuff churning around there is my experience looking at the way like 10 years ago. So on like Facebook um, news page comment sections, the amount of anti-Muslim sentiment in Minnesota is absolutely horrifying. Like it's honestly it remind it, it, it feels like like a lot of those folks want extermination uh that you talk about like he said call, makes that mogadishu joke 
you see these folks they say things like Minas Somalia and stuff like that because of yeah. all their refugees and stuff and it is some of the most rancid shit I've seen um in my life and Charlie wants that uh in his audience it reflects itself upon a national level in the way that Ilhan Omar is treated, given the no, fact. No, that's that why she, they hate her so much. Yeah, she is a national figure for that kind of bigotry. So, yikes! All right, uh, ten more. Is this me? What was your experience working as an intern for the Cuomo campaign? Did you meet him, and was he a creep? No. Uh, when I was fifteen, I wanted to get involved in politics i knew that and i got people to sign i walked around uh downtown manhattan by the offices uh and i got people to sign a piece of paper saying they'd support him that was my entire job so dumb i didn't get paid either it's just to put on my college resume and i did it for like a few days or a, two weeks or something like that it was just not worth my time Punch drunk pulpit. Although, you know, I still work for him, obviously. Punch drunk pulpit. Worth checking out the HBO doc, The Lady in the Dale, to see how Tucker Carlson's dad made his name by publicly harassing a trans woman. It's family business. Oh. Huh. Wow. Lady in the Dale. I'm writing that down. Uh, let me know if this has been done already or if someone's planning on doing it, but a documentary on the long line of Tucker's uh, sort of almost like homicidal uh, homophobia where he's like the dan white society yeah. and uh that sort of stuff would be a very interesting uh, uh document to have out there north dakota llama fun fact one of the oldest moss in the country resides in max north dakota mm -hmm. it was first cut out by peat moss and was constructed during the move west in the 1800s islam in the u.s has been around for a long time yep Rob Pitkin, what's the timeline for the next booster for 18 plus? Both my parents got the shot, but no word on adults. Are we just waiting for another spike? I, I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't give you a sense of the timeline. I don't really know. Oh, that's the mosque. Wow, it looks tiny. Yeah, they might have. This looks newer though. They might have re updated um, it. Updated it, but yeah, tiny little mosque, in North Dakota. It's like one of those like tiny houses. Is this what Thomas Jefferson would have wanted, <laughs> or would he have been massively confused? <laughs> Sam from uh, Sarah from Arkansas really loved the guest and topic today. The right sees our history as a war and tradition. Oh, I you are, I already read this one. Um, truck nuts four twenty. Hey, a bit of awful news. Um, from Michigan. The trial for the attempt to kidnap the and murder our governor, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, recently concluded with no convictions. Two were actually acquitted because the jury said they were too incompetent to cause any harm. There were also issues with the FBI sting. The right is going absolutely bonkers in the state and then feel vindicated for their violence. This is unreal. Yeah, you know, I'm a little mixed on that story because it does seem like there was um, FBI encouragement but i do still think they should be held accountable yeah I, I i feel the same way like i i am not somebody who thinks this is exactly of a kind of the entrapment of say muslims uh by the fbi i think it's insulting uh and does frankly work for their defense uh that i'm not willing to do uh to just grant them that that's the same sort of ge uh, generic fbi overreach thing uh, but that said like i don't trust the fbi either so Hitchens Ghost. Jordan Peterson is his own worst enemy. Think Joe Rogan podcast, forced monogamy, equality of sexual outcome, cuck humiliation. Yes, it's like an amazing clip. Now he says nothing that someone else is required to provide can be a right. How can he square that with abortion rights? Aren't women's body and consent required for the right of a fertilized egg to grow from a clump of cells into a viable human baby? Hmm. Really thought about that one for a long time before weirdly moving your fingers around and dropping two truth bombs. Eh, Doc? Yeah, he really... Uh... His fingers are very involved in his broadcasting. All right, three more. Sean from Maryland, what's makes what makes Carr and Wilson lame people? Just curious about your thoughts. I know I think I know why, lol. Um I'm fine with you being religious. Maybe just not being super weird about it would be nice. Um, uh, but it's like Russell Wilson named his son Win, W I N. And he's just corny. This is this is a known fact. 
This is a known fact. Check out the the photo shoot he did with um not only his children but uh, uh Sierra's child with Future. Check check him out. Yeah, it's saying go Hawks. He was basically management in the locker room. That's why none of the other players liked him. That's that that was that's how he presented himself. Um, good player though. And also just the weirdness of like the holy water thing getting divorced and then not sleeping with Sierra until they got married. Like, I'm pretty sure you already broke one of the vows, my man. And being vocal about that too. Little bizarre. All right. Two more. Slappy tubs. Don't forget the mall of Africa, Matt. Oh, I hadn't heard that one. Jesus. No, it's a joke. Like, I think no, Mall of America. It's a racist joke. Oh. That, that's like the Minnesota thing. Oh, I thought they were. Uh, okay. That's I thought they, they mean, were yeah. joking that, like, you know. Okay. Yeah, no. I, I hadn't heard that look one. Look but... at conservatives being crazy. There's no Mall of Africa, but that's what people no, yeah, used to say. That's what. That must be what, yeah, people say about the Mall of America because they don't like how many black people are there. And the final I am of the day. Actually, we'll do two more. Left is deaf. Do you really want to make uh, white nationalist head explode? Teach their kids the history of enslaved Muslims in the 18th century United States. Sylvian Diouf's book, Servants of Allah, African Muslims Enslaved in the Americas, should be a must-read for high schoolers. And the final I am of the day, Obama Gate Hotel Plumber. President Jefferson welcomed the first Muslim ambassador who hailed from Tunis to the White House in 1805. Mm. Because it was Ramadan, the president moved the state dinner from 3.30 p.m. to precisely at sunset, a recognition of the Tunisian ambassador's religious beliefs. More apology to her from the founding fathers. Why don't you be proud of America, Thomas? If not, it was so he moved it to practically at sun, uh, precisely at sunset, a recognition of Tunisian ambassador's religious beliefs, if not quite America's first official celebration of Ramadan. That is a very cool tidbit. Thank you. Obamagate Hotel Plumber. I mean, yeah, the thing about um, Jefferson is like on having a lifestyle that's entirely um, sort of supported by uh, brutal slavery gives you free time to occasionally cultivate a based belief here or there. Yep. All right. Um, folks, great show today. Thank you guys so much. We're holding down the fort till Sam gets back. Appreciate you all. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Somehow I lost my drive Between the one 